Hi, everybody. It's JJ, and we're back again for another ASUS PC DIY hardware stream. And uh, hopefully everybody's wrapping up their week on of a positive and productive footing. Everybody is uh, staying safe and staying healthy. Uh, we've got a lot of things to cover. Uh, and this week has just been absolutely packed with tons of different announcements, uh, including, of course, for those of you that have checked out, of course, uh, PC DIY's uh, group, as well as, of course, our recent live stream from yesterday. You guys know about the brand new addition to our M5 lineup, which is going to be the Crosshair X670E Hero Board. We're going to go ahead and take a little bit of a look at it again today. Recap also on the Crosshair X670E Extreme. So highlighting the actual two Crosshair series boards that we're going to have. And then also from there, we've got actually quite a number of other new products. So we've got actually the RG Delta S Core, which I talked about in a prior stream, which is actually now getting ready to launch. We're finally going to be uh, launching the uh, ROG Strix Flare 2 non-animate edition keyboard. So for those of you that are really excited about the Flare and that 8K pulling, we're going to be talking about that guy. We've also got the ROG Spalding Edition Basketball. I'm really excited about the brand new AP201 chassis. Uh, that is going to be our micro ATX chassis, and it's actually going to be coming in at even a little bit of a lower price point than we originally talked about. And of course, we have it in black and we have it in white. Uh, we've got actually the Zen Screen OLED portable monitor, which is an absolutely awesome display. If you're really looking to take advantage of OLED, uh, it's going to be, I think, a great addition to be able to throw in your bag or maybe even have it as a secondary desktop display. Plus, we've got some other VA series monitors within our Asus monitor lineup. Um, and uh, I think, of course, we've got the Asus PC DIY Builders Spotlight. So let's see who we have joining us here on the stream. Erica, thanks so much for letting us know the audio is good. Sneff, the one and only, our friend from Canada, the master builder himself, uh, is joining us here. Miguel, thanks for joining us here on the stream. Michael, as always, thanks for joining us here as well. Who else we got? Masar. Uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, H2O Computers. Oh, man, always great to have you here. Thanks for joining us here on the stream. Uh, I think PGPCs uh, was also on the stream as well. So we've got uh, Eric Mills. Uh, let's go ahead and say hi to you as well. So thanks so much for joining us here on the stream. Let's get ready to go ahead and kick things off. First and foremost, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about AM5. So I think this is probably one of the biggest overall announcements that we've had uh, in terms of just something that's brand new. So we're going to go ahead and actually talk about the brand new boards. I think first up is going to just be giving you guys, again, a re-highlight to the brand new introduction with the ROG Crosshair X670E Hero board. So this is going to be one of our AM5 series boards. For those of you that are kind of wondering what that's all about, of course, right now, AMD has the AM4 socket. So that would be for B550 as well as X570. You also have legacy-based chipsets like B450, as well as X470. But this is going to be the new upcoming chipset, which will be supporting the Zen 4-based microarchitecture. You're going to have support for PCI Gen 5. You're going to have support for DDR5. And it's pretty much going to be the movement forward in terms of the AMD platform. So of course, Asus being the number one motherboard manufacturer in the world, uh, we're going to have you covered in terms of um, the ROG series of boards, but we're also going to have actually a few other series of boards, but you guys will have to make sure to keep it tuned here to find out about those guys. So let's go ahead and just take a little bit of a closer look here at the crosshair. If you guys are interested in getting all the specifics, I would recommend that you guys check out actually the full stream that we did yesterday where we went hands on with the board, but I do have it right here. Uh, we'll take a quick just peek at it. Uh, just so again, you guys can check it out. It's an absolutely fantastic board. I have to be careful with the way that I show it because it's uh, so almost chrome-like in terms of the electroplating process that it reflects everything that I have here in terms of the room. So uh, there you guys can see just how clean it looks. So if you're somebody that doesn't like RGB, it's a really refined and really kind of premium aesthetic that this board has. So you can entirely just disable the lighting and have this super clean premium look. I think it looks fantastic. But of course, if you're going to take it up to the next level, and you want to take advantage, of course, of the RGB lighting that the board has, it's going to look really great. So let's go ahead and just quickly take a look here at the board. If you guys have any questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, drop them there in the chat. But as I noted, um, we have a full stream that I went ahead and did yesterday where we dived into kind of all the specifics for the board. And if you have any questions, then you can definitely find it out. So um, right here, here is a closer look at the board. It looks absolutely fantastic. Of course, you can see right there the transition to the new type of socket that AMD is going to have for this AM5-based platform. Uh, DDR5 memory support right there. This is going to be the Polymo lighting display. And we'll take a quick look under the secondary camera just to actually see it in person as opposed to just in 
a, a picture. Um, but this is a multi-layered RGB display. It's a little bit different uh, than the display that we have right here on the board next to me, which is the uh, Extreme Series board. And that one you see has the Anime Matrix. And I'll do a side-by-side -side to compare the Extreme and the Hero board in case you're wondering. But this is a multi-layered display. So you can go into Armory Crate and essentially have different kind of uh, looks for it. And you can control the lighting for it, but you can't define your own uh, kind of um, image or animation like you can with the Anime Matrix, okay? Uh, beyond that, of course, you're gonna see it's a traditional ATX-based board. And of course, super high-end team power stage, power delivery design. Uh, you're gonna see a lot, a lot of nice premium connectors here. So we're gonna have cool things like the 20 gigabit front USB-C. You have the Q-release technology, which allows you to install a graphics card to eject it just at the push of a button. Uh, of course, you've got your start and stop button, your debug LED code that's on there. This board will have four M.2 SSDs on board that will be supported. So one here, uh, two here, three here, and then four here, and then a five through an additional adding card. Um, and then of course, I think the big thing is, let's go ahead and take a look at the um, the thing that I, is, I think really the coolest thing uh, probably about this board, which is going to be the IO on it, which I think has been for a lot of people, one of the number one reasons why they actually check out the Crosshair Zero uh, Kira series, it's going to be its IO configuration. So. Uh, let's just quickly go ahead and take a look at that. So you can see right here that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. Uh, rear ports all on the back, and those are all USB 3.2. Uh, in fact, we're also, I think, one up in competitors here at really giving you the best port selection that's out there. So 40 gigabits and 20 gigabits and then 10 gigabits. So you're going to have all of those available to you. Plus the USB-C will also support display output support. So if you want to be able to go ahead and connect that uh, to an external display, you're also going to have that flexibility. Clear CMOS, USB BIOS flashback, all that good stuff, all the kind of advanced connectivity that you expect for an RG series board. Premium ALC audio codec with an improved ESS Sabre DAC for this generation with better actually THD, better signal noise ratio, and uh, a lower noise floor. Uh, so overall, a fantastic board. And we're going to quickly just take a look at a side-by-side -side in the extreme. But before I go ahead and get into any of that, I just want to go ahead and just pop, a, uh, pop over and take a closer look physically at the board here and see if anybody has any quick questions on this before we take a look here at the extreme. Irish Wolf is saying, wow, I definitely agree. Um, 12, yeah. So keep in mind, that's just 12 for the back. And then you've got the uh, 20 gigabits port in the front. And then you have the USB 3 port that's there also in the front. So that's going to be another two. So that in itself, right, collectively, you're going to have uh, what well, that's 14, 15 total ports that are going to be available to you, plus then your USB 2 internal headers. That's a huge level of connectivity that's available right there, right? Um, so DevTrend is asking, is X670E the newest chipset? Yes, that will be the flagship chipset for AMD. So that is going to be essentially the chipset for the enthusiasts that are looking kind of for the most feature-rich boards, especially when you're talking about you want the flexibility to have PCI Express Gen 5 support for uh, the graphics. And then you're also going to be looking for some form of PCI Express Gen 5 support for your M.2 based SSDs. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> Board looks awesome. Uh, it's such a shame. Uh, Rune, um, you know, pricing is always going to be one of those things that I think is interesting, but I would definitely challenge that if you really talk about the feature set, uh, there's some people that say, you know, that the boards are expensive. And definitely when you move over to a newer type of substrate material um, that's required for things like PCI Gen 5 support, DDR5, you're going over from, consider in the past, some boards were like four layer boards. That's cheaper to produce than something like an eight layer board with low loss, right? Um, an ROG board like a Crosshair compared to a really great board like the Tough Gaming series or the ROG Strict series boards, has an ESS Sabre DAC, that's going to cost more. We have a dedicated water cooling zone header that's designed for inlet and outlet and flow monitoring. Does a normal user need that? No, but it costs more to put it on there. We have advanced features like all those I.O. configurations and being able to support display out through those I.O. configurations. Uh, then you add in the advanced power um, you know, components that are going to be here. All those things add additional costs. Now, does that mean that you can't get a stable and reliable experience? Unquestionably not. We feel very confident that if you're looking at boards like our Prime series or Tough Gaming series, our entry ROG Strix series, you're going to get a great experience. But, you know, um, for enthusiasts out there, the Crosshair series are the benchmark series of motherboards out there. John says, uh, man, that is a good looking board. And Snef, uh, one of my, of course, favorite builders and modders out there says the pure beauty. So let's go ahead and just quickly take a closer look at this board. Um, I'll show you a couple of the quick things and then we'll just do a little bit of side by side on the extreme. And then we're going to switch over and uh, take a look, of course, at some of the other items here. 
And again, if anybody's interested, we had a full length live stream that covered this board in depth that we went kind of all the data points over on it that we could disclose at this time, because right now there are still some elements that are under embargo. So make sure to keep it tuned in the future for a full in-depth launch live stream that will cover everything for our AM5 based motherboards. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take a look right here. All right, guys, so here we can see just a little bit of a closer look at the board. It looks fantastic, right? You can, of course, see that, like I was noting, it has that almost chrome-like appearance that we have here with the electroplating process, excuse me, electroplating process that we have for the Polymo display. And as we go ahead and just pull this up, you're just going to see just how clean the board looks. So it's got this really nice monochromatic color scheme, so black, and then kind of, I would say, like silver. Um, and it goes really great with the foundation of kind of any build that you're looking for. There's no fixed colors. And then, of course, you can do all the accents that you want through, of course, RGB lighting. You'll see these super large VRM massive heat sinks. They're even larger than the prior generation. Um, absolutely just beastly. You got that full, of course, heat pipe that's in there. Um, very, very high performance based power delivery. Um, this one, I get a lot of questions. One of the biggest questions that we had here is like, why is there a six pin underneath the PCI, uh, excuse me, underneath the 24 pin power? That that six pin is there because it supplements power for that guy right there, the front USB header. So if you connect that power, you can support up to 60 watts. So if you wanted to like fast charge something like our G14 laptop or a ZenBook or a VivaBook laptop or like a RG Phone 6, um, you can do that up to 60 watts when you connect that to uh, that for that port. OK, um, another feature, of course, probably a lot of people know about is going to be this one right here. This is the Q release technology. So we uh, unveiled this on AMD base, excuse me, on Intel based systems. And now we're offering it on an AMD based system. So let me go ahead and just quickly show it. I think probably most of you have seen this feature now, but in case you haven't, Let's go ahead and show you uh, what it's all about. So, of course, here you've got your PCI Express slot, and you'll see right there that the latch is kind of pretty difficult to access it, especially with this really big heat sink for your uh, PCIe NVMe based SSD. So the cool thing right here is that if you wanted to go ahead and take advantage of being able to easily remove your graphics card, you would have your graphics cards installed, but you could see how am I supposed to get to that latch? So in the past, you would have to have maybe something very thin. You try to push down on that and eject it, but now, there's that button right there, that Q release. And all I need to do is just pretty much hold down that button and I can pull the graphics card out. So it makes the uh, installation and the removal process really, really simple. If you're troubleshooting, if you're upgrading, if you're cleaning, whatever it might be, it just makes the process super easy um, and very, very easy to overall work with, right? So again, just hold down that button, pull it out and you're good to go. So it's a really kind of streamlined experience uh, for those of you that, again, are going to be upgrading, cleaning, removing the graphics card, whatever it might be. Um, it's a very, very simple overall experience. OK, so that is pretty cool. And uh, I think that's all the main things I want to show there. I want to go ahead and double check, make sure we have any questions before I just show the quick comparison between the extreme board. Um, so give me one second here. Let me see if we have any questions that have popped up right here. <laughs> Tony says, I will take two. Pretty cool. Um, so let me see here. Uh, How many M.2 SSDs can work simultaneously without disabling any of their features? So Marco, we can't talk about PCI lane mapping because that's all part of kind of this technical performance aspects of the chipset. So just make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned. Rest assured that we'll talk about PCI lane mapping configuration when we get to the launch. We'll actually cover that in depth in terms of kind of the launch live stream, where I'll help you guys understand that if let's say, you know, how is the actual, the, the slots allocated? Do you have like a 16 uh, slot and then a by eight by eight type of configuration? You know, um, are you linked to this type of uh, chipset lane? Are you linked to the CPU? You know, how does that configuration work? There's a lot of variables and that actually adds elements in terms of the cost and the complexity of one board versus another board, but definitely rest assured, we will be uh, talking about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ada DK, you know, we rolled out that feature on Z690. We put it on a lot of motherboards. We put it on strict series motherboards and maximum series boards, but it's physically more uh, expensive because, of course, there's a mechanism that's built onto the motherboard to allow for that. So with Tough Gaming, you know, we're trying to also give you a really great board, but at a little bit more of an aggressive price point. So that was the main reason why it wasn't present on there. OK. Um, Kin. 
kind of cheat AOA. It's saying is you might need to revise the manual. It actually all depends on the motherboard. So that feature is pretty new. We only launched that type of technology just pretty much for Z690. So like in prior generations, some of the boards that might have had like an auxiliary PCI Express power connector actually might have had it there for supplemental power. Um, and usually for the supplemental power, it would have usually been for PCIe supplemental power. So for like multi GPU configurations, but that's really less of a factor nowadays because most users are not running any type of multi GPU configuration. Okay. And let me just see. Um, Rocky's asking, how many SATA connectors will it have? It has on the board. Again, we can go back here just for reference. Let's go ahead and just take a look right down there at the bottom. It has six SATA ports that are on the motherboard. And again, in terms of your M.2, you've got one that'll be right here. Then there's going to be another one right here. There'll be another one right here. And then there'll be another one right here. So there'll be a total of four. And this board also does have what we call the dual-sided M.2 uh, design, which means that there's essentially a heat sink on the underside, and then there's the heat sink on the top side. Um, and that is going to be present for three of the drives, not four of them, but all four of them also do feature our Q latch technology. So you're being good to go. Masar is asking about a PCI riser cable. Um, keep in mind, I don't advocate PCI riser cables. They can tend to be more problematic in terms of having uh, signal stability. Um, many times they're not fully EMI validated to be able to ensure. But as long as you get a high quality cable, eventually if there's going to be a PCI Gen 5 riser cable, then there shouldn't be any interoperability issues. But keep in mind that the PCI signal, um, when you went over to PCI Gen 4 versus PCI Gen 3, and then also similarly for PCI Gen 5, it's extremely stringent and very sensitive. So the quality of the cable, the length, a lot of these things matter in terms of helping to ensure uh, really the best experience possible, okay? All right, uh, so let's go ahead and quickly just uh, take a closer look here at the extreme so that we can take a look kind of quickly at the differences. I'm going to quickly show you just kind of a side-by-side -side image difference, and then we'll also just quickly take a look at the spec difference, and then we'll wrap things up on that just because uh, I know that maybe some of you have already kind of checked out our stream from yesterday. So let me go ahead and just bring up our two images right here and we'll be good to go. So give me one second here. All right, we've got one right there, and then we've got the other right there. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so uh, for your reference, guys, this is going to be the X, uh, excuse me, the X670E Extreme, and then also the X670 Hero. So these are both under our Crosshair series. So people always wonder kind of what's the fundamental difference between those series of motherboards, is that it's important to keep in mind that when we're talking about kind of our positioning, Tough Gaming is our entry series gaming boards. Then we have ROG Strix, which is our kind of mid-range enthusiast. And then ROG Crosshair is part of the ROG Formal series. No Strix in the naming. Those are our flagship series gaming products, OK? So here we can see that we've got the X670 Extreme, and then we have the X670 Extreme um, Hero. So uh, both of these boards are essentially going to be very high end, but there are some differences. Of course, here we can see this is ATX. Here we can see this one is EATX. This one has the anime matrix based display. This one has the polymo based display. This one has the OLED live dash stat display, which is a two inch display that lets you show things like frequency, voltage, temperatures, different readout uh, points. They both have the Q-Latch technology. They're both four DIMM based boards. They both have 20 gigabits. They both have that 60 watt fast charging technology. They both have extremely high and high performance based VRM designs, although the extremes is even higher end. Um, both of them are using SPS-based power stages, 110 amps, 45 amps in terms of the uh, rating for the microfine alloy inductors, um, 10K rated capacitors on both of those, which is generally twice the standard in terms of the industry. You'll see that there's actually side RGB lighting that's on this board as well, where this one does not have it. This also has right angled connectors with actually more specialized connectors as well for things like the breakout ARGB and fan controller that's included in the box. And then they both have the same premium audio design where you have that new ESS Sabre DAC and amp, which is built on board. So um, uh, the overall configuration too, in terms of the M.2 SSDs, they both support up to five, but they support them slightly differently. So this board also has multiple M.2 SSDs that can be installed directly on there. But one cool advantage is that right here, you see this Gen.Z.2. This is the new specialized PCI Gen 5 add-in card that can be installed directly on the board right next to the DIMMs. So that's really cool because even if you have a graphics card, everything installed, you could literally just take out the card, put it on there, and then put it back onto the board, and bam, you would be good to go. Um, so now let's go ahead and just quickly take a look at the difference in terms of the I.O. configuration between the two. They're both super stacked, very, very uh, impressive in terms of the I.O. configuration on both of these boards. 
So it's not like we're talking about a massive difference, um, but there is a little bit of a difference. So let's quickly take a look here. Uh, this is again on the extreme, right? And so we'll see right here, 12 ports on the rear, okay? But you have dual LAN, 10G and 2.5G, and then Wi-Fi 6E. You still get 40 gigabits and 20 gigabits. And again, you have the 20 gigabits up here in the front. But uh, this board, oh, sorry. Uh, this board does also have uh, the USB-C. There's two internal USB-C headers. So one and then a second, okay? Uh, and there we can see right there, there's that actual uh, Gen Z dot uh, two adding card and then the hyper m.2 adding card and then when we go here to the hero you can see the hero is pretty much almost the same 12 ports right uh, but only a single lan 2.5g wi-fi 6c 20 gigabits it still has dual front usb3 headers right but it has the legacy header which has been reinforced for this generation um, and then your usb c okay so that just gives you a little bit of the differential there. The Extreme also comes with a lot more in the box. Um, like I said, the uh, VRM has been upgraded and there's a, some other kind of differences. And we'll definitely get into all the details on how they differ exactly when we get closer to the launch. Okay. All right. Let me quickly just see if we have any last questions right there before we get ready to move it on. Um, didn't, like I said, I want to take too much time uh, to cover that. If you guys have more kind of things that you're just wondering about in terms of the board, definitely make sure to check out the live stream that we did yesterday. It's up on the YouTube channel right now. Um, Michael's asking, what are the specs of the PCIe 5 drive? There's no drive that's included. So um, the actual interface is designed for PCI Gen 5. So that means that whatever drive you would put on there. So take, for instance, like Fyshawn, who's an actual controller company, has already demoed you know, drives that are showing 10 gigabits or even faster than 10 gigabits. That would be the performance of that actual drive, right? So it's a PCI Gen 5 interface that is available to you. And then it's up to you to install whichever M.2 based SSD that you want on there. OK. Um, as far as anything else you're wondering about on AM5, all we're going to tell you is just make sure to keep it tuned. If you're watching here on the PC DIY Hardware Weekly live stream, as well as you're part of the PC DIY group, you're going to find out what we have coming in terms of AM5. So rest assured, we've got more coming. Um, and, uh, you know, as I've noted in the past, if you guys are not aware, let me go ahead and just drop it there in the chat. We do currently have an AM5 website that's already up right now. And you can see right there that there's more information to come, right? So we've got, you know, RG, RG Strix, Tough Gaming, Prime, you know, ProArt. So just make sure to keep it tuned and you'll see information in the not too distant future, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that in the chat. Um, pricing, we're not talking about anything on pricing because we haven't gotten yet to the launch. So just make sure to keep it tuned there, okay? Um, is the drive shown going to move into production? I'm not sure what you mean. Everything that we're showing you right here is part of the actual final production of the product. So um, that adding card will be included with uh, the board. And the Hyper M.2 adding card is something that we've already done with Z690. So yes, it will be uh, shipping with those products, okay? Andy, thanks so much. I really do think that they're fantastic looking boards. Um, it's good. Uh, let me see right here. These boards. Um, hey, Michael, uh, we'll be talking about the AP201. So if you have more questions, hopefully on the AP201 in a little bit, when we get there, hopefully you'll have them answered. If not, of course, you can make sure to go ahead and, uh, you know, just let me know in the chat or you can go ahead and tag me in the PC DIY group. OK, so that goes ahead and wraps us up for uh, just the updates that I want to go ahead and touch on. Again, we're really excited about AM5. We're going to have a full dedicated live stream that we'll do uh, just like we've done for all of our chipset launches where we'll cover all the motherboards in depth. We'll talk about all their features and functions and design differences. Hopefully we'll also be able to do very closely to the launch, um, you know, a performance kind of insight like we did for 12th gen series processors where we can show the UBFI, talk about tweaking and tuning, um, you know, go into all of our kind of features and functions in a live fashion to make sure you guys have the opportunity to really understand all the cool stuff that we're doing for our AM5 series based motherboards. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get ready to keep moving things along. All right.
Very, very cool. So I think next up right here, um, let me see what we've got going on. Let's go ahead and just quickly touch on some uh, quick giveaway announcements. I'm going to just go through these really quickly because I've gone ahead and covered these uh, fairly recently over the last couple of weeks. But just in case some of you that are joining us right now are new, uh, we want to go ahead and just let you know that we do have some giveaways going on. So let's go ahead and talk about the first one. The first one has got 15 days left, and it is just for our friends in Canada. So if you're checking us in Canada, this giveaway is just for you. Uh, it's an uh, AMD Affiliate Plus Stream PC system. So you actually have, I think it's an AMD Tough Gaming X570 Plus Gaming Motherboard. You can see a 5600X, Tough Gaming LC240 AIO, 16 gigabytes of memory, a Tough Gaming 3070 graphics card, an SN750 from WD, and an SN551 terabyte drive, and then Windows 10. And that's all put together in a full system. So it's a pretty sweet giveaway. If you want to go ahead and get in on it, all you got to do is just... Um, you know, enter in through the app. So I'm going to go ahead and drop that link there in there in the chat for you guys, if you guys are interested. So make sure to go ahead and get in on that one. Okay. Um, John, sorry, if you have a question, just make sure to go ahead and drop it there for me in the chat when I can. Like I said, it's, you know, I've got to monitor, you know, what I've got going on here as well as intermittently checking to see what is posted there in terms of the chat. And if I can answer your question, I will try to make sure to get to it. Um, next one here is we've got one that is going to be uh, collaboration with our friends over at actually, it's this is um, Intel, Newegg, ENIAC, um, Asus, all kind of uh, together here to be able to put together a really awesome prize pool for a really cool kind of mod full system build that you've got right here. So you can see this is actually a pretty cool system. It's uh, based right there on a Z690 based tough gaming motherboard. You can see that it's all custom cooled and water cooled. It's pretty cool, pretty crazy in terms of the overall kind of just look and feel for the system. Uh, but if you want the opportunity to win a full high end and unique theme uh it's pretty sweet so that's actually the build that's the system that you can actually win and you can see 12900k an rtx 3080 base graphics card strix edition um, then a tough gaming z z690 plus board that's all inside that master frame 700 um, a one terabyte mp600 uh, pcie mbme ssd 32 gigabytes of ram our thor 1200 watt power supply and then windows 11 and then you can see tons of other stuff in there uh, so corsair and and primo chill based components there for the water cooling land lease streamer cables and even that little speaker soundbar you get that included in there so uh, that's all part of the giveaway so i'm going to go ahead and drop that one in the chat right there Sizepawn is asking uh, is when is a new ROG pre-build coming out? Um, so that's a great question. I can't really comment on that too much. Uh, everything that we focus on here on the PCDIY stream is under what we call our open platform business group. So um, this is always a little bit confusing to explain to people, but Asus is of course one big company, but we actually have what are called two business groups. We have a systems business group and we have an open platform business group. So our open platform business group covers pretty much all the components uh, that we produce. And then products like systems, which include everything from like tablets to phones to laptops to desktop systems, um, those are all under our system business group. And they're kind of two separate businesses and two separate teams. So we don't focus on anything in our systems business group on the stream because it's not PC DIY. Although you could definitely upgrade, you know, a pre-build based system. Um, so we don't cover any of those type of products. Maybe in the future, we're going to actually have a dedicated systems um, kind of live stream that will focus on things like our laptops, our phones, and, you know, desktop systems. But this stream focuses just on our PCDIY hardware. If you're wondering about it, maybe a specific product that we might have announced, if you want to go ahead and email me, PCDIY at ASUS.com, I'll see if I can go ahead and uh, look into it for you and see if I can find out that information. Okay. All right. Um, Next up, of course, we've got, you know, the mother of all giveaways. Everybody has been getting in on this one. This is our ROG Evangelion worldwide base giveaway. So, of course, we're uh, giving away up to $8,000 here in terms of total prizes. Um, an absolutely just awesome prize pack, right? One grand winner is going to win the 3090 thousand watt power supply and then EVA edition um, M.2 enclosure. Then we've got the runner up, which is the 3090 and a thousand watt power supply. Both the power supplies are the Thor 2 edition power, power supplies. Then we've got the second uh, runner up prize, which is my, I think my favorite prize, which is the Maximus Z690 Hero, the Ryogen 360 and the Helios chassis. Uh, that's an awesome prize pack. And then we've got three runner up prizes with the Delta S headset and the Curious Wireless um, 
mouse along with the script uh, the strict scope rx uh, keyboard and then the scabbard 2 uh, desk mat and then we're also got here you can see giving away the monitor and then our 2.5 gigabit and wi-fi 6 router um, so that's pretty sweet so all you got to do again to get in on this one is just drop your uh, link uh, drop excuse me drop your entrant information into the app so we'll go ahead and drop that one in there all right, so that takes care of our giveaways. So let me go ahead and just close out of theirs and I drop the AM5. Let me just quickly see if we have any other questions that have kind of come up right in there. Um, MUFC14, can you post a link where to buy the RG Phone 6? Again, like I said, we don't focus on any system related products in here. There's no actual link either because I can tell you for North America at least, we're probably not getting the RG Phone 6 until somewhere in about maybe probably September timeframe. So make sure to just watch our social media channels. We'll definitely provide visibility once it's kind of becoming available. Um, and that would include availability from like the ASUS store, which will probably be the first place to list it online and then followed up by kind of our other e-tail channel partners in terms of availability. But uh, we're still looking probably sometime until maybe September in terms of availability, okay? Um, pushing Polygon says, when will we be seeing ATX 3.0 power supplies on the stream in the near future? For one, uh, this specification is brand new, and so it's going to take some time to see it kind of roll out, but it's not necessarily kind of a requirement, right? Because um, if you talk about actually kind of the way that power supplies are designed, there's a lot of flexibility when the actual development occurs to be able to actually tailor it to align with the merit of what the PCI uh, excuse me, with ATX 3.0 specification is attempting to put forth, which is a focus on transient performance, uh, which is complementary to kind of higher end graphics cards. This is also kind of in alignment with PCI Gen 5 um, based, you know, next generation graphics cards and things along those lines. And so our like Thor 2 current power supplies are actually already kind of very high performance based solutions. And they come with a PCI Gen 5 based connection for those next generation based kind of graphics cards that use that, or actually some of the, the cards that have just come to the market, like the, you know, 3090 Ti take for instance, right, that have that. So, um, but, you know, we're always actively working in terms of the forefront to have kind of the latest gener gener generation specification support. But as always, specifications take time in terms of not only from being kind of being finalized, but then in terms of being actually integrated into a product design and then actually being produced. And especially still with the state of the industry where you have you know things like logistic challenges and a lot of other variables that are occurring right now, just in the state of uh, kind of communication in the world environment that it is, these things take time. So it's probably still gonna be a bit before you see anything that would be based on that new specification standard, okay? All right. Um, hey, Angel, what up, man? Happy to have you here on the stream. Thanks so much for joining us here, okay? Uh, Johnny Boy, as we noted, in terms of actually anything that it comes to the PCI lane mapping, we won't be talking about the PCI lane mapping today. We'll be talking about that once we actually the embargo lifts, um, just because all that is kind of defined in with some of the performance criteria. So um, definitely rest assured in our full dedicated live stream that covers all the motherboards, we'll go into any PCI lane mapping configuration um, kind of uh, factors uh, relative to each board because different boards, depending actually on how the actual PCI lane uh, quick switches, read drivers and layout configuration occurs, will have very different kind of experiences, right? So that is a very good question uh, and it will vary depending on model, but we can't go into that right now. Okay. All right. Um, Evangelion asking about Wave 4. No, if there was Wave 4, I would be letting you know about Wave 4. So Wave 4 is not going to be happening. And Wave 2 and 3 pretty much finally just about hit. Um, I think that, you know, earlier this week, we had pretty much the majority of those items finally start to come online. Um, I'm working to try to find out on when we might next get a next batch refresh, because I know that actually quite a number of the items already just pretty much almost sold out. So I know there's some people kind of hoping to be able to pick up on that again, but um, I'm still waiting for some feedback from our product management team on when we might get refreshes for items that were present between uh, wave one, wave two, and wave three. And wave four probably will have a little bit more information thinking maybe next week, okay? So just make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned, okay? All right, um, let me go ahead and get ready to go into our next question right here, and then we'll go to our next item. Um, let's see right here. Are there any plans on EKWB collabs or the like? I'm not sure what you mean by 
collab. So, you know, you know, we work already very closely with EK and we do a lot of different stuff with them as far as what we may or may not do in the future. I can't comment on that. Um, you know, they're a great partner, but we have a lot of great partners that work with us in terms of water cooling for interoperability support, you know, like on our Strix series. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure that we're the number one graphics card board partner in terms of block support. Uh, the only other card that technically has as many or maybe a little bit more would be the standard kind of FE based card. But, you know, we have support from Bits Power, from EK, from Fantex, from uh, thermal take, you know, from uh, pretty much uh, from Optimus, from almost all the key kind of water cooling uh, vendors. And then, of course, on motherboard side, we've got tons of support there on the motherboard side. And we've done a lot of stuff like even what you have right here, which is the EKWB Asus Edition graphics card, right? So um, there's always, always things that kind of we're working on. Plus, you've got boards like, you know, the Maximus Formula or the Glacial, which were collaborations also with EK. All right, um, let's get ready to go ahead and get into the next item right here, guys. Uh, and we'll keep moving things along. So I think uh, the next thing I want to go ahead and talk about is just, again, um, let's go... Let's go with the keyboard. I think keyboard. Let's, let's, let's check that out. So we've got the ROG Strix Flare 2. This is going to be an update to, of course, the original Fair, which is a very, very popular key, uh, keyboard that we offered. Uh, but this one is going to be bringing about some definitely some very cool stuff. So let's go ahead and take a look at this guy and just talk a little bit about some of the cool elements on what we've got for this keyboard. So um, here you guys can actually take a look at this really cool, of course, keyboard. Uh, the kind of the big updates that I would say for this generation in terms of what you're going to have is that this one will be featuring an 8K base pulling. So that's going to really allow for ultra fast, of course, input response. Keep in mind that pulling at that rate does really kind of often work through the USB 3 bus interface and actually can take a little bit of CPU resources. Um, this also features our RG NX switches, which are actually our factory lube. They're very smooth. They actually have an optimized actuation point. Um, and we have them and actually three different versions. So we have ROG NX switches, which are going to be browns, reds, and blues. So you've got your, you know, your classic reds, which are linears. You've got your browns, which are your tactiles, and then you've got your blues, which are going to be your clickies. Um, so you've got uh, kind of those three different switches. And another thing that some people actually don't realize about switches is that the ROG NX switch is also unique in the fact that we do what's called factory binning. So when you actually produce, let's say, like 60 switches, you might not realize that there's actually a certain amount of deviation between each switch that gets produced in terms of its actuation performance. This is normal uh, from the factory. Uh, but what we can do is we actually can go through a higher level of tolerances um, to be able to actually ensure that there's what's called a plus or minus smaller amount. So gram force deviation um, is tighter between each switch. And this allows for a more consistent experience across all the switches. It's more expensive to do it this way, but it does allow us to have a better, more consistent switch experience. A lot of times when people buy like switches independently in the custom scene, sometimes you might buy, oh, buy more switches than normal because you're trying to actually account for a little bit of that gram force deviation. And this can actually be pretty noticeable. Sometimes it can be like 15 to even 20 uh, gram force deviation can be possible. And for the ROG NX switches, the actual gram force tolerance target that we have is plus or minus five. So it's, it's quite tight. Um, it's very, very good. Um, the PBT keycaps on here, are, of course, also going to be great because you don't have to worry about kind of, um, you know, the uh, the legends wearing out or anything like that. They also are much more resistant to shine uh, and things along those lines. We've also gone ahead and improved the stabilizers that are on here. So these are going to be better than your standard type of stabs that are going to be on a keyboard. There's an internal sound dampening phone, which gives it a nice kind of little bit more thickened kind of sound, which a lot of people like there. And that reduces pinging inside the body. Uh, you got that dedicated, of course, set of media keys, which you saw on on there as well in the volume knob that's also present uh, that's on that keyboard. And of course you have that rest rest, which is included. It has onboard memory. So you can of course store multiple profiles. You have of course custom macro support and there's a USB pass through support on there and hardware level lighting control. So if you actually use the function key and the arrow keys, you don't even need to use our software, but you can actually adjust the lighting and brightness and switch through different modes all directly from the keyboard. So um, it's a very cool keyboard. Now, of course, you know, if you're not a fan of a full size, we've got tons of TKL based options and even things that get smaller like what I'm using right here with the Falchion at 65%. But if you're Tim, if you're team Nempad, you know, you want your 10 key, then this is a pretty sweet keyboard um, to be able to check out. And definitely it comes in at a bit less than, of course, 
the standard keyboard, uh, excuse me, not the standard, but the higher end version of this, which is going to be the RG Strix Flare Animate. And the Animate is going to be a bit more expensive because the, of course, the Animate has hot swap switches and it also has an LED diffuser in that wrist rest. So you get this really cool kind of LED bar in the front. Kind of like what you see right here on this keyboard, you get that in the front, but you also, even if you put the wrist rest, you also get the diffuse bar that's going to be there. So um, let's just quickly go recap through that and I'll see if anybody has any questions. And as you can see, uh, 179 is going to be the price point and we'll be pretty much having the, all the availability for all three of them at about the same time. So that will be for the red, the blue, and the browns. Okay, so all three versions will pretty much be available around the same time. Okay, so there you can see the keyboard, really nice uh, in terms of the overall kind of just clean, refined aesthetic. And of course, this media key right here, um, you can do play, pause, skip track, volume adjustment. Um, it's all accessible right there. It feels really nice too. That 8K pulling rate that's available right there. Again, you've got your blues, you've got your browns, you've got your reds. PBT keycaps that come included with that, so no extra cost to you. And these do support standard Cherry MX stems, so if you wanted to go ahead and use your own keycaps, you could replace them. The sound dampening foam on the inside, uh, the dedicated media keys that I talked about there, the detachable wrist rest if you uh, wanna go ahead and use one. And of course that USB pass-through, which is great for things like putting like, maybe if you wanna have your wireless adapter for your wireless mouse, like maybe like our ROG Gladius 3 or the Curious, or you know maybe something like a flash drive, then you could do that. Keep in mind though, it is only USB 2, okay? All right, uh, let me quickly just see if we got any uh, quick questions right there on the Flare 2. And if not, we'll keep moving things along. Um, Nelson is asking, does this come in white? This one does not come in white. It only comes in just that color. Um, but uh, let me go ahead and show you right here. We do have, if you're interested in white, I think I can bring it up right here. Yeah. We do have our Moonlight White. Um, so this is actually our Moonlight White ROG Strix Tiki L base keyboard. It's pretty much the same keyboard that I have right here next to me. This is the black version, but we have it in white. And the white one does come with our ROG NX switches. So you still get those premium ROG NX switches that I talked about. It has a detachable cable, which is really cool. So you can go ahead and customize the cable if you wanted to. Um, and I really like the TKL based form factor. It allows for a little bit more flexibility of positioning, especially for gaming. Um, a lot of the features are similar on this model, uh, but it is not uh, excuse me, but it doesn't have the sound dampening foam. We also do have an updated wireless version that just came out, but that one's not in white. But if you want white, this would be the one that I would check out, okay? Um, any USB connectivity, Johnny Boy? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that question, but as I noted, the USB pass-through, USB pass-through on that model is going to be um, USB 2 in terms of the pass-through on the port. Um, John, no accessories that we sell right now directly, but you can always reach out to our services support team. They may be able to see if maybe we have something on hand. Um, I can't guarantee that, but you know, you can check with them and see what they may have available. Okay. When will this be on an AMD platform? Um, sorry, Thiessen, if you can let me know what your question was again. What are you asking about? When will what be available on the AMD platform? Uh, pushing polygons, what on the keyboard actually determines the USB? So that's actually defined generally by the MCU, which is the actual microcontroller. So there's actually a chip that's built onto the PCB board that defines the actual input. Uh, protocol. Um, and generally most of those, because there's no reason to use USB 3, uh, they generally are going to be using USB 2. But um, as you're kind of moving up to more advanced controllers that are offering more functionality, and like I said, higher polling and other things like that, there's the potential for them to kind of move into USB 3. Part of the other factor too is also power consumption. Um, you know, it's actually gone up for keyboards because you now have things like RGB lighting and other things along those lines. But there's a lot of kind of pieces that go into the kind of the componentry that gets integrated and what may or may not be possible. Possible on, on the keyboard. Oh, PGPCs, that's a really good question. Is the ROG plate removable like on the original Flare? So yeah, the Flare had that really cool little plate that you could customize. We actually found that some people use that, but not that many people. I thought it was a really cool feature, but this one does not. So it is fixed on that model. So if you did kind of like that, that is something that is not present on the ROG Flare too. HTO Computer says, uh, I've got three of those EK Asus GPUs. That's pretty cool. Yeah, they're no longer produced, so that is pretty cool. Um, 
All right, very cool. All right, let's get ready to go ahead and keep moving things along. Yes, don't worry, we're gonna be talking about the Prime AP201 in just a little bit. So I'm gonna talk about uh, this ROG Delta headset and then we're gonna get into the AP201 because um, it's definitely a product that I've been really excited for for quite some time. So rest assured, we are gonna be talking about that guy in just a little bit, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and keep moving things along here. That is gonna be uh, the RG Strix Flare. Um, this is just gonna be a quick update. So um, many of you guys know if you if you've seen uh, kind of recommendations in the group, I'm always recommend the ROG Delta. It's my overall favorite gaming headset that we do offer, but it is definitely a little bit on the more expensive side. And that's because of course it has a lot of premium elements like that ESS quad saber DAC technology that's built into it, native USB-C interface, right? That really cool, of course, dynamic RGB lighting. Uh, but there's some other cool things that, that are really work well about the Delta, which we, if we remove, we can still maintain. Um, and be able to offer at a lower price point. And that's what we're trying to target here with the ROG Delta S Core. So let's go ahead and take a look at this guy and see just how it kind of stacks up and where it sits within the relative landscape. So um, let me go ahead and bring this one up here. Okay. Um, allow you to go ahead and check this out here. So this one is going to be coming at a lower price point, and you can see right here, it's a great looking headset. Um, big difference is, of course, you don't see any type of RGB lighting on this. This is also gonna be an analog base headset, so 3.5 base millimeter as opposed to USB-C. There's no quad ESS Sabre DAC and amp that's built in here, so it's gonna be more reliant on the quality of the DAC and the amp that you're using on the device that you have. So your laptop, your desktop, your phone, wherever you're gonna be connecting this to. Um, it does, of course, still utilize the similar design in terms of the overall headset. So it's still lightweight. This is using a very lightweight based overall body and composition. So 279 grams. I think anything under 300 grams is really actually very comfortable. You can wear it for a long amount of time. One of the really cool things I do like about the actual Delta is, is that we actually give you two sets of ear pads uh, or ear cushions. You still get that with this model. So one is going to be more of an isolated based um, pad which is very comfortable and gives you actually, a, I think a little bit more of a, a thump, a little bit more of kind of an isolated sound, um, but it can be a little bit warmer. And then the other set of pads um, actually reduce the isolation, but they have even much, much better breathing ability. So if you kind of run maybe a little bit hotter or maybe you're a little bit ambient environment, you can pick and choose which one you want. You can just remove the ear pad and then go ahead and replace the ear pad. We also have gone ahead and updated uh, the actual material to even be more abrasion resistant. So you actually can really have a high quality lifespan out of there. You can see you have on ear cup controls that are also present on there. We do have strain relief built into both sides of the connector. So you don't worry, you have to worry about like fatiguing or wearing that cable out. And overall, it's got that really just nice kind of clean aesthetic um, that the Delta has. So I think they're, they're a great looking headset. They sound really nice too with a 50 millimeter essence driver. They're really solid for music, movies, or games. But again, keep in mind compared to like the higher end Delta, which has that quad DAC technology and that amp built into it, which allows it to have a very consistent sound experience on whatever device you're connecting to. This one is going to be a little bit more dependent based on the device you're connecting it to. But if it's got a good, uh, you know, sound card uh, in there, then you you can expect a good quality uh, experience and definitely um, nice, solid mid-range, uh, good, well-defined bass that's not muddy and good clarity on the upper end. And the microphone's quite solid. Uh, of course, it's a it's a boom and you have to kind of directionally make sure it's aligned there, but it's clear, it's intelligible, um, and it, it's not, I'd say, a weak sounding mic. So overall, solid choice for $79.99 there. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and I just want to quickly show you right here just how the kind of the landscape for the deltas line up because I know some people kind of wonder like, oh, hey, you know, what is the difference between all these different models right here? So give me one second right here. Michael says, uh, the old school red and black combo never goes out of style. Yeah, it's got that classic kind of ROG vibe on it, right? Because we went back with the kind of the classic styling. Um, I think it works really well. Okay, so here again, this is going to be 3.5 millimeter, uh, 50 millimeter essence drivers, right? And of course, with it being 3.5 millimeter means you can pretty much use it with whatever you want, right? On ear cup controls, which we went ahead and talked about. And here you can see the entire kind of lineup that we have for the ROG Delta. So it's quite expansive, right? So um, we have the Delta Core S. We have the ROG Delta S wireless, which just came out, which is now finally our wireless Bluetooth and 
uh, 2.4 gigahertz, the Delta S Animate and the Delta S, which are pretty much the same. It's just the Delta S Animate has the, of course, customizable display on it. The Delta S is the lightweight edition of the original Delta, uh, along with the AI noise canceling microphone. Um, it does also have the improved ear pad design in terms of even being more durable. The Delta is still my overall favorite, even though it was the very first one that we launched. I think it's overall my favorite sound signature. Um, still very reasonable in terms of the price point. And that one's the native USB-C with the quad ESS Sabre DAC and amp. And then you go to the Origin, which is USB-C, but no ESS Sabre DAC and amp built in and then the Delta Core. And the Delta Core is very much like the Delta S, where they are kind of the most entry-level models that don't have the DAC and their 3.5 millimeter base. And you can see down there at the bottom, the big differences in terms of kind of the weight, where you can see with the Delta S Core, it's the lightest, um, the lightest model within the entire stack, right? So 270 grams versus if we take a look like at the original Delta, you can see the original Delta is 387 grams, which I wouldn't say is heavy, but it's noticeable. Um, it's, you know, for me, it's entirely fine, but I could definitely see how somebody that's maybe a little bit smaller might want something a little bit lighter, okay? And uh, this one should be coming out in probably about the next about two weeks or so, okay? All right, let's get ready to talk about the AP201, but let me go ahead and just see if we have any questions right here uh, for anybody in the chat. And I believe I also dropped the link there um, for the uh, Flare 2. Uh, John's asking, do you have any promotion codes for the Ryogen 2 LC? Um, no, we did have one not that long ago, but if you're wondering about that, let me actually show you something that we do occasionally update you want to make sure to keep track of it and i'll drop the link in the chat so we have actually this program that we call asus infinity so if you actually go to the asus infinity you'll see that there's different tabs here it says like motherboard monitor routers gaming peripherals chassis power supplies so we actually update these and you can see that we'll actually have promotions on different types of items uh, that are available so um, you can actually see like right here this is still um it's not as good as the deal that we had a little bit earlier where it was like 60 dollars off but here's like the rg strix 1000 watt power supply you know, $30 off right now that you can get it, right? Or if you're looking at maybe one of our chassis, you can actually see right now the Helios. Hey, you can save 20 bucks on the Helios. Or uh, peripherals, usually we have really, really nice actually promo sometimes on the peripherals. Like the RG Strix Scope, one of my favorite keyboards that we make, 30 bucks off, right? So you can watch out sometimes here and we'll have listed promos uh, for things like, um, you know, our different products within the Asus series. So, um, you know, take a look at that. I will drop that there in the chat for you, John, and uh, maybe you'll be able to go ahead and pick up a Ryogen at a little bit of a lower price point. TM Custom saying, hey, JJ, hope you enjoy the review of the Asus Tough Gaming uh, 120 fan. Best regards from Igor's Labs, one of the absolute best technical reviewers out there. Uh, thanks so much for letting us know, TM Custom. Yeah, I think they recently posted actually a review on our Tough Gaming 120 millimeter RGB fan. Um, I think it's actually a great all around fan. If you talk about the price point that it's at in the US, it's under $20. Um, it has a dual um, array LED based design and uses a very premium fluid based bearing, which is very rare at that price point. Um, I think it's a fantastic choice and we'll be offering it in white and in black and a single pack and a three pack fan. If you've been finally looking for a fan from Asus that's RGB, white or black, I think it's gonna be a great option and you guys can check out that review which actually does some really good um, measurement analysis that you can actually really see that uh, even though traditionally when you talk about an RGB fan offering lower performance than let's say a non RGB based fan, when it comes to things like static pressure and airflow, um, it's very, very good. And if you compare it to some of my favorite fans, like what you can see with like the Cooler Master or some of the land lease solutions, you'll find that we are offering very good performance when it comes to static pressure and airflow. So overall, pretty cool. All right. Um, so let's ready to go ahead and talk about the AP201. All right. So uh, AP201, let's bring up my points right here. All right. So this is going to be uh, very cool. And uh, I think I actually might maybe tease out a little bit of some of the amazing work that SNEF uh, is actually done here because we actually sent him over an AP201 to be able to do a cool build for our CNE event that we're going to be having in Canada in the not too distant future. Uh, but let me go ahead and bring this up. So AP201. Here we go. Okay. So I've got to... Uh, photos up here. 
All right, so this is going to be our a micro ATX based chassis. Uh, of course, it being micro ATX means that you can go ahead and support both mini ITX, mini DTX, and micro ATX based chassis. Uh, the really kind of unique element within this chassis, of course, it uses a quasi mesh based design throughout the entirety of the body. Uh, the reason why we chose this is really to be able to maximize its overall thermal characteristics uh, within it. Um, and this really gives us a really great thermal performance, uh, even for high end course configuration. So if you're running something like a 12700K, 12, 12900K, 12, a Ryzen 5900, 5950X, you've got really great airflow to be able to ensure that you're not thermally starving any one of those components within the unit. So of course, you can see you've got lots of room in here. This is going to be a 33 liter chassis, which some people think um, doesn't qualify as like a compact build. And definitely it's going to be bigger than a, the breaking point, which a lot of people consider for true SFF, which is 20 liters. But I would say that it's a very compact 33 liters. Um, so it is still really compact at fitting the level of hardware that you can in here, which is, like I said, micro ATX and up to 300 and 60 millimeter uh, based cooling configurations. And we'll talk a little bit more on some of the actual cooling configurations that you can have within this unit right here. Um, so the cool thing is in terms of the layout, you'll see that there's actually some really cool kind of layout decisions that we did here. So you've got the micro ATX chassis, full support for even the biggest graphics cards. We make pretty much some of the biggest graphics cards on the market. So even if you're putting in a 3080 Ti, 3090, it can fit in here. Um, we have a nice isolated bay there for the actual power supply up to 180 millimeters uh, that's gonna be able to be supported in there and of course you have a lot of configuration options for how the fans can also be oriented in there so let's go ahead and take a little bit closer look here um, now this is the crazy part 57,000 holes with the quasi mesh pattern the cool thing about the actual pattern is not only does it actually allow for great thermal performance but it also offers for a very kind of distinctive design aesthetic so you actually will notice this and you actually still get a little bit of kind of a silhouette id so you can see the components on the inside as well as actually kind of the rgb illumination as opposed to a chassis which just has just sealed panels right so that also gives you a little bit of difference in terms of the front io you've got usb3 and this is also a 10 gigabit rated usb c port and the other thing is if you look at this price point it's quite competitive right 80 dollars for the white version uh excuse me um actually this is the other way around sorry about that let me edit that quickly that should actually be the other way around so it should be I believe 79.99 uh for the white and then um excuse me, uh, $79.99 uh, for the black. And then it would be $84.99 for the white. So I'll tweak that. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, sorry about that. Just had to make sure that that was corrected there. <clears throat> Um, of course, we have this really nice, simple and secure clipping mechanism to be easily be able to access the drive, excuse me, and not only access the drives, but the internals that were within the chassis. Uh, 32 millimeters is nice. That's actually a pretty good amount of cable room, uh, cable management options. So even if you're going to be putting things like fan controllers, ARGB controllers, or of course, just be able to manage your fans uh, and manage, of course, your power supply leads so that you've got a nice amount of room that's there on the actual backside. And of course, there you can see the two different colors. But here, let's go ahead and dive a little bit closer and actually take a look at some of the permutations and the configurations that we have available in terms of how you can lay out some of the items on here, okay? And we'll also just kind of to go through a little bit more of a general flow right here in terms of the chassis. I'm gonna switch over to the black version uh, just so we can just kind of see the little bit of the layout, just difference in terms of the black versus the white. And so here you can, of course, see the internal uh, the internal layout in terms of the actual chassis. And it does come installed with one fan just for the front. And then the rest is going to be entirely up to you in terms of how you want to go, go ahead and configure things. And then you can see here's the pass-through cable that you'll have. So here's where the power supply cable will attach at the back. But then you're going to see you have a cable right here that would connect generally to the bottom for the power supply, right? So you would mount your power supply here, and then you would go in there. And you can put an SFX-based power supply, but it does support traditional standard ATX-based power supplies. And then you could optionally mount something like here, like a fan controller, or an ARGB controller, of course, an SSD. It's entirely up to you. Here's an exploded view where you can actually also see how you can remove the top if you want to be able to go ahead and mount things like your radiator, uh, screw in your fans, depending on what you're going to be looking for. And then, of course, at the bottom, you've also got your uh, mesh filter that's also available to you. Remove the panels right here, and you can see that this 
uh, panel right here, which would be on this side, can easily be removed to be able to give you either more room or more flexibility for different types of options, whether you want to maybe put in something like a, a specialized distro, maybe like a pump in a reservoir, or you know, just you wanted more kind of flexibility and more room for the front base configuration. Okay. So we're going to go and I'm going to bring up actually our little uh, layout guide here. And then I'm going to go ahead and take a look here in a moment and see uh, what questions we might have that might have popped up right here. In terms of availability, this should be coming in in the not too distant future, probably in about the next two weeks or so. So uh, very shortly in terms of its overall availability. So uh, here we can all see just overall kind of some of the layout options that you're going to have available. Let me go ahead and just make a tweak, tweak to that so you can see that just a little bit more clearly. Um, so you can see right here, you can support up to 620 millimeter fans that would be available to you. And these are configurations that we have gone ahead and tested. We're also going to be working with our team to do some additional validation with different types of tower heat sink solutions. So users that might be wondering about, hey, can I fit in like this Noctua or this Be Quiet or, you know, specific type of options, uh, we are going to go ahead and release some additional information to give you kind of clarity on some of the Z height clearance factors uh, so that if you're wondering about that, you'll have that information at play. But as you can see right there, uh, 120 millimeter right there, and then three there at the top, and then two there at the bottom. For the 140 millimeter, you can see you've got the, of course, uh, pre-designated options available to you at the top for 140 millimeter, but not at the bottom. Now, does that mean that you couldn't put 140 millimeter on the bottom? No, not necessarily. It depends on actually fans. You can actually get some 140 millimeters, but actually have spacing um, in terms of actually the way that the screw um, mounts for the actual 120 millimeter diameter. Um, you could also actually take an adapter and utilize an adapter in place. The main thing you have to account for, of course, is gonna be the actual Z height clearance and how that will relate to your GPU and some other factors along those lines. But potentially it could be possible, just depends. In terms of what we've technically standardized in terms of validation though, as you can see, it's 140 is designed for the top, then 120s are pretty much designed throughout. And this really actually makes the most sense in most situations, the best range of fans on the market are gonna be 120. A lot of people think always 140s are going to be better in terms of tonality, but actually I think that the best fans generally are going to be 120s more often than not, uh, just in terms of the actual quality of the static pressure performance, the airflow, the construction of the fan, and a lot of other elements. Plus, we only make the XF120 and the tough gaming fans in 120 millimeters, okay? Um, then there in the back, of course, 120 millimeter support at the top, you can support 280 and 360. So a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can go about for your mounting configurations, okay? And um, here you can see in terms of storage option configuration, there's going to be uh, quite a bit of flexibility that you have there. So you can see here at the bottom, you can also go through different types of mounting configurations for different drives. Now, keep in mind, don't have to just use drives here. You could mount this a little bit differently. If you want to be able to have, you know, 2.5, you could get adapters that can actually use that same type of actually form factor for different types of devices. So again, you've got flexibility to use that mounting point for something that's not necessarily that device, right? So that just kind of comes down to you. But again, you can see right here in terms of traditional drives, one, two, or three are all available to you and those can be mounted in there, right? And then 2.5, similarly, you can see we already have pre-tapped that for 2.5 or for 3.5. So both those taps exist there in place to allow you to go ahead and mount those drive configurations. But at the same time, take for instance, like this could be M.2, right? You can actually get like three and a quarter drive base, which have M.2 enclosures in them. And then you could run that with a PCI Express cable to the motherboard if you wanted to have M.2 base expansion, right? There's a lot of interesting ways you could go about stuff if you think about that that's just the space that you can use for something else. You don't necessarily have to think about it purely from the perspective that we're defining it, but it can be difficult to kind of give you always like, it could be in this and this and this and this type of configuration. So it's just something to be mindful of, okay? All right. Um, let me just see if I missed anything here. Okay, so here, lastly, I want to touch on this, which is going to be for the front panel base configuration, right? So you can see here in terms of the front panel configuration, cooling, storage, PSU, you can see right here, uh, we've got different kind of configurations available where you got the PSU uh, mounting bracket, uh, the optimal kind of PSU length, which you can see varies, right, depending on what you're looking for the configuration, um, then how you can leverage 3.5, 2.5s, and then how that actually plays out with things like the top AIO and your uh, 120 millimeter fan base configurations, okay? So overall, very flexible chassis, and I think for its price point, a really great option. So if you're looking for something compact, looks different, thermally it's gonna be well balanced and you know really be able to handle high-end componentry well, whether you wanna go with an air focus build, you wanna go with an AIO focus build, or you're gonna to wanna to go with custom water cooling, you can definitely get it done, 
All right. So let's go ahead and see uh, if we got any questions. Wow, there's a lot of comments that have popped up in there for the AP201. So let me just see here right there. Um, all right. So let me see. I'm trying to let me go back here and just get ready to try to see right here. Okay. <clears throat> um I saw that you did on the announcement with SNEF's uh, build log. Yes. So, yeah. So, SNEF actually has been sent over an actual AP201 to do a build right here. Um, I don't, let me see if I, I don't know if I have those images right here to be able to pull them up. So, let me actually see if I, if I can pull them up. One second. I'll see if I can pull those up right now. And let me just see right here. DevTrend says, I need a mini ITX case. Well, this could definitely fit a mini ITX. Of course, there's going to be much more compact if you want to go with true mini ITX. I think it just depends on, you know, what's the level of flexibility and the expansion support that you want, right? So you can kind of go with a few different options in terms of how you want to be able to approach a mini ITX based build. Nelson Lopez says, beautiful, just beautiful. That's fantastic. Very, very cool. Um, TM Customs. So yeah, so actually, as I noted, it's the other way around. So that was a misprint on my side in terms of the pricing, right? The black is the cheaper one and the white is just a little bit more expensive, right? Yeah, so um, that's a good point. So yes, we actually have already gotten, done testing in terms of actually supporting higher end PSU configurations. Part of the thing with the EPSUs, right, is there's actually some variance in terms of not only their Z height, but also actually their cable configurations and actually how that extends length, right? But yeah, I would actually say totally, you're not, uh, you're totally not wrong in terms of then being able to actually go through. Yep. Does the main board have an NTC connection for temperature sensing custom water cooling? I don't know which motherboard you're talking about in terms of that. Um, many of our motherboards do have what's called an optional temp sensor interface, which a lot, which is used by a lot of water cooling enthusiasts. Um, so you would generally be able to check that in within the tech specs for which model you're looking at. If you see optional temp sensor, then you can put a thermistor on there so that you could go ahead and use that as an input source. Uh, Suman's asking, when will this be uh, released? Uh, again, like I said, probably target time frame. We're probably looking at about two weeks in terms of the overall availability. DevTrend saying, is there any plans for a glass panel? So we've actually discussed this internally. Right now, no. We have no plans to have a, um, let's say, clear panel. We are evaluating a, probably a couple of different options. If we did do something, I would tell you at earliest, it wouldn't be probably until the beginning of next year. Um, so we're going to continue to just look and see what kind of the reception and the feedback is right now for the AP201. And then we can take a look at maybe having some um, accessories that could potentially be produced, including something like an actual side glass panel. Uh, our focus really here was, though, first and foremost, thermals. Um, so that's the reason why we went with the quasi mesh paneling for the entirety of the design. Uh, but we do know that some people would want to be able to, of course, see all their components. And to do that, they would want to have uh, an offset, right? They're willing to go ahead and have maybe a little bit of an increase in temperatures, but, um, you know, go with something in terms of some type of clear panel. So as far as what that might look like, we're still evaluating that. And like I said, at earliest, it probably wouldn't be until the beginning of next year. Michael, that's fantastic. If you want to email me, pcdiyasus.com, that would be fantastic in terms of um, you know sharing that doc, and we can see how that also aligns with the testing information that we're going to be doing. Um, in terms of availability, yes, uh, two weeks. It could be maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, um, maybe in the AC store, it might be maybe even a week or so. Um, we're gonna. I'm waiting to get my sample in so that I actually can do a dedicated live stream. That we'll do it just on the AP201, and I'll actually do some live test fitting and different kind of layout configurations and things like that. So. Uh, cool is asking about, are we going to do anything in terms of anything kind of custom water cooling collaboration for AM5? Nothing that I can talk about right now. So all I can tell you is to make sure to keep it tuned. But I would tell you with very high confidence that rest assured, um, key water block partners are working, of course, to be able to support boards like the Hero and the Extreme. The Hero, I think probably almost every generation has had monoblock support from partners like, say, for instance, like EK and Bits Power, who produce a monoblock so that if you want to be able to have coverage for the CPU and for the BRM, they have produced that. As far as whether or not we'll have something direct from the factory. Um, I can't comment on what we may or may not have. So just make sure to keep it tuned in the future for our full product announcement in terms of what we'll have for AM5, okay?
Marcus is saying, when can we affect the Tough Gaming fan, the White Edition? Probably uh, same thing. I think before the end of September, uh, you'll be able to have the availability for sure. It could be within August. Right now, we already just launched the 120 Black, and the Black is available right now. You can go to Amazon. You can buy it right now on Amazon. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have the White Edition probably um, before the end of this month, maybe in the third week of August, um, but it could possibly get to the very end of this month. Um, asking about the PA147 CDV, probably a little bit more of an update towards the end of Q3 in terms of time frame. Okay. Um, let me see. I'll go with one more question right here. Is there a reason why a third fan wasn't supported on the bottom? I think it just came down to because, you know, uh, you know, with all chassis, right, it's always a balancing act in terms of tool uh, of tooling consideration um, and time and production and things like that. And already... You have to really remember it's been extremely challenging. Um, we actually had quite a number of specialized chassis that we were designing and developing, and the pandemic hit, and the pandemic really affected a lot of production and processing capabilities. And um, you know that affected a lot of the development timeline for a lot of the chassis that we've actually been designing and developing. And so at one point, eventually, you kind of have to just stop and say, you know, is the configuration kind of meet, I think, the criteria that you're really trying to hit for the majority of the market. Sure, you may find that there could be things that you could just have a little bit more and have this much more flexibility. Or maybe if you did this and it added maybe one or two more millimeters of height, or you could do this, and it becomes a really big kind of back and forth. And I think right now, we felt that for the price point, for its production, for it being a brand new series, we think that it hits enough right points to be able to offer a really solid foundation. And, you know, in the future, of course, if it's something to reside to revise, that's always a possibility. But I think right now, now, having the flexibility of having to be able to go with three versus two, the reality is that 360 to 240, even for custom water cool configurations, doesn't really make that much of a thermal difference. So the benefit of really facilitating to be able to go to three, I don't think has really that much merit. It just comes sometimes to a checkbox that people say, I need to have this and I need to have this. But, you know, at the same time, if we, you know, we can do it and we can try to balance it out, that's always something like, again, that we can revisit. But it's just, you know, it's it's always going to be a balancing act, right? Okay. Um, JJ, how hard is the case to have a modular front panel IO to have newer standards as they come out down the line? It's not that difficult. It just depends on uh, the biggest factor that actually a lot of people forget when you talk about chassis development is, is that there's always the clear kind of difference in terms of the expectation from a user's perspective and then also a production perspective. So I'll give you a very good example. People that can sometimes custom make their own chassis, they don't care about EMI compliance because they don't have testing equipment to be able to check EMI interference and how the chassis is influencing things like that. And anytime you make something modular as opposed to being fixed, it can actually affect characteristics like that, right? Um, there can also be cost complexity because you're actually having to produce more parts. So even though it's, it, it could be so subtly simple to say, well, just having this so that I could remove this and add this, it could maybe actually add, you know, X number of costs to it. And that depends on how the chassis has been designed, but more pieces and more tooling is always going to be more expensive than less pieces and less tooling. So it becomes just kind of a balancing act. Um, this is also similar to some of the challenges with another product there. This we're going to go in a little bit pivot before we actually get into wrapping up with our monitors here. Um, but let me go ahead and just show you something here and let me see if I have it. So speaking of modular, um, you know, we've actually been thinking about modular for a long time in different products, um, not only in kind of chassis, but even in, in board design. So a cool product right here, even kind of staying with the theme of something like micro ATX is um, this is actually something that we I was very, working very closely with our team and one of our product management team to kind of help to look at this. And this was the ROG Avalon concept. And this was actually to kind of redesign what the perspective would be on a small form factor based build. And so here, you know, you can see we actually had some really interesting approaches. So here you could actually mount your radiator. You could have actually your fans, right? They would be configured on one side. We actually, what we're using, what's called edge-based connectors for the PSU, which actually have much better efficiency. They're easier to install. You don't have to worry about kind of as many kind of cables. They can just directly kind of slot in. Um, and here would be the front of the chassis and you could have actually like a lot of modularity. And so we actually had concepted actually of a model having this be on a breakout PCIe panel. So you could actually remove this at this time, which this was years ago, we were already thinking of the future. Like, hey, you could have USB-C, you could have actually four access, which right now chassis, they don't, it's crazy to me that we went away from having hot swap 
to not having hot swap on chassis, right? Um, but here you can imagine having like hot swap for four M.2 based SSDs, or, you know, at this time it was SATA based SSDs, right? Um, and even there was interesting things that we did here where this was mini ITX, um, right? but it had direct access at the top to be able to go ahead and have access to our top M.2, to the CPU, to the cooler, uh, to the memory configuration. These panels quickly just popped off on the sides and you could immediately access the sides to be able to swap things out. You could see you could just drop in my graphics card, bam, I would be good to go. I would just run a simple cable to it, I'd be set. Um, and we had to have an entirely custom motherboard actually for this design that we had to develop here uh, for this. And so, this was really kind of interesting and cool because we had to play around with the different kind of perspective in terms of how do you actually lay everything out on kind of isolated modular boards. Um, but the cool flexibility of this type of design is also allowed us to do a lot of really cool things. So other cool things would have been um, like here where you could actually swap out um, and have less cables because you were using all these edge connectors. Like I said, you, you pretty much would just have the PSU, which would dock in directly into the board, power all of that. You wouldn't have all these auxiliary cables that you'd have to worry about. And the only real kind of cable that you had to worry about was gonna be for the graphics card, which would be an item that you would kind of wanna swap out, right? So it made it really kind of convenient, which is pretty cool. And here's the IO. The IO was actually modular. So we could actually pull out the IO and you could swap that out. But even in things like this, you actually have to have them fully sealed and you would have to have them EMI tested because the actual IO can be very sensitive to EMI and to ESD in terms of also maintaining not only stability and performance. So there's a lot of nuts and bolts that actually come into this stuff. And um, depending on the scale of the company and their internal R&D and capabilities, sometimes they look at these things and sometimes they don't look at some of these things. This is also one of the reasons why, like I said, that um, you know, even when we first released our riser cable, and it's only a Gen 3 riser cable, they're now Gen 4, um, we were very stringent on wanting to do AMI compliance and signal analysis testing on it because we knew that if you were trying to maintain the best protocol, you would want to have one that met that high spec standard, right? So there's a lot of things to kind of keep in mind there, right? But um, anyways, uh, hopefully that gives you just a little bit of perspective there, right? So um, hopefully that answers also your question, okay? um triangle why did you choose the triangle design for the headset oh that's actually a really good question so before i get into the next product right here let me answer that because that's actually a really good question so um oh hey michael thanks for that that comment there will be no better sff micro atx case i agree i think you know our goal was to try to make something that was cost aggressive we wanted to really hit um about a hundred dollars if not lower than $100, and really have a focus on ease of building. Um, there's a lot of really great chassis, and we work with a lot of great partners, you know, um, in terms of chassis, right? So everything from Lian Li to Cooler Master, Dan Case, M Case. There's been so many great companies that focus on doing really compact, really flexible type of designs, but they can still be actually quite challenging in terms of kind of layout and configuration. And really the goal with why we targeted Micro ATX is it wasn't going to be hard really for people, whether they were first time builders or somebody that built 10 systems, could comfortably and easily work within the system, not have thermal constraints, be able to kind of pick whatever kind of really hardware they wanted, whatever type of cooling solution, and make it work at a far easier degree than a very compact like 20 liter type chassis, which yes, you could do it, um, and yes, you can definitely make them work, but they can definitely be quite a bit more challenging to kind of get everything laid out there, right? All right, um, so let me answer that question on the triangle element right here on the headphones. So for that, I think actually I might go here back to my overhead. So let me go ahead here. So let me see if I can show you this here. So this is uh, the RG Deltas, right? And the thing that's interesting here is that when you talk about the actual uh, size, right, a lot of times people use an oval design, but we actually did um, hundreds of actually head sample tests. And the reason why we actually picked this kind of more triangular shape is because it actually it's in better alignment with the um, the way that your actually ear is shaped. So people have, of course, different size ears. And the important thing is that if you make it kind of flat, it ends up actually potentially pressing up against the uh, top part of your actually ear lobe. And so if I was actually to remove this, what you'll actually see right here is that it's actually offset. And even a lot of reviewers don't pick up on this really well, but it's what makes this actually Delta actually sound not only good, but actually gives it actually much more comfortable 
um, I'd say balance in terms of how it sits against your ear and against your head. So you can actually see right here is that there's a 12 degree angle and the 12 degree angle is designed to essentially give your room for your ear because it's actually naturally at a slant and it's naturally at an angle. So it doesn't directly kind of just push out and push up against the ear lobe. And so this is essentially, this shape is more triangular than it is essentially like an oval type of structure. So that's actually part of the reason why we designed it like that. And this is actually a little bit more expensive because, um, you know, from a development standpoint, you know, going with a standard kind of tooled kind of oval is cheaper, but actually having a multi-layered injection molded type of design, like this is actually more expensive. So we had to take some more time to design and develop what we felt was a more ergonomic type of design uh, that was more sensible, especially for long sessions, because um, part of the reason why your ear here heats up is if that, if this, you know, cushion, right, is pressing up against your ear, it's absorbing more of that heat and it's retaining more of that heat, right? So again, if you have a little bit more space there, there's just a little bit more airflow, there's a little bit more breathability in it to maintain, an, I think, more overall comfortable experience. So... Anyways, uh, hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go ahead and go with that. Okay, um, let me go ahead and get ready to keep moving this along. And hopefully I answered all those questions there on the AP201. Uh, next up, we've got the Zenscreed OLED MQ16AH. So this is gonna be another really cool product. Um, one of my favorite actually products that I think that we've released recently. So the Zen Screen series is of course our portable based monitors. Um, and the really cool thing here that we've got with the Zen Screen OLED is of course, this is going to be a portable OLED display. So you're gonna be able to really kind of take it to the next level in terms of course, that contrast because you essentially have that infinite contrast because you can actually go to true black, right? Um, you have outstanding factory calibration in terms of color accuracy for this. And you have some really nice design implementations here. So cool thing is that right here, this little hood that you get, it actually comes inside the box. We actually give you a dual use purpose box. So the box could actually even be used as a hood so that if you want to even be able to have kind of a little bit more of a focused um, kind of a space to be able to view content in, then you can actually set it up like this way. If you don't, then don't worry about it. You don't have to use the box in this, but we're just kind of showing you how the actual box can be set up. Now it's being shown here, of course, with the laptop because it's a portable disc display, but you could attach this to anything that has, of course, support for micro HDMI or USB-C display port. So that I conclude, it could be like a phone, it could be a laptop, it could be a desktop, right? Um, of course, with mini HDMI, it could be a mirrorless camera, it could be a Nintendo Switch, it doesn't matter, right? It, it, pretty much everything supports HDMI. And then alternatively, if it supports the display, display port over USB-C, that would be another display connection, right? You can also see here too, you can sit, to, sit it up with these little props that also come in there. So it can be a little fat back focus kind of field of view, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, here you can of course be seen in terms of a console use if you wanted to. And one of the really cool things is that while this is not like our XG series monitors, which support ultra high refresh rate, right? So we've had XG monitors at what, uh, like, you know, 144 hertz and then even 240 hertz, right? Um, OLED has, of course, an extremely low response time of true one millisecond. Um, so it's extremely fast, very, very good motion clarity performance that you have available to you. So um, it's actually really good for a portable gaming display if you want to connect to something like a Switch or, you know, even a phone or even a secondary laptop. If you want to use that, maybe your laptop is, you know, a display from a few years ago, you could actually, you know, use this. Uh, and even though it's only, quote, unquote 60 hertz with that one millisecond you could still really have a really great gaming experience um, it also comes included with this actually tripod mount so this is actually a threaded mount so you can go ahead and use a different type of bracket adapter for uh, any number of different types of options that are out there to be able to use to facilitate actually mounting it like this if you want to be able to have it set up so you could use that to be able to position your laptop directly underneath here you can go and of course also either orientation if you want to use this vertically or horizontally. So if you want to use this, maybe like a side accent monitor to your primary monitor to maybe run Discord, email, chat, look at photos and videos, and either horizontal or landscape orientation, you could entirely do that. You've got a level of cool flexibility that's available to you right there. And the other cool thing is you didn't notice um, the way that we actually set up the actual display configuration, we've actually further improved upon this compared to prior um, models that we had. So we've actually enabled the display input on both sides, on this side, 
or on this side. So depending on however you're set up, you can still run the cable from either side to be able to input. So that is a really cool level of flexibility that you have available to you, okay? Um, let me go ahead and just show you a couple of other little things right here for this monitor. And again, you can see right there the price. This will be coming in at $399. So definitely this will be a bit more of an expensive base display, but you are talking again about OLED in terms of this being an OLED-based panel compared to, let's say, any of the other number PA or, or MB series monitors that we have. And we have MB series monitors that I think literally go down to about $100, almost $130. So this is definitely at a higher end of the spectrum, right? Um, but you, know, you are talking about an extremely lightweight and a very versatile and very high quality portable-based display, right? Now, keep in mind that this is not like some of our Zen screens that have an integrated battery, which would allow it to be truly kind of portable, which means that you wouldn't have to power it. So this one, you do have to provide power to it. So do keep that in mind, right? And it can be powered directly over the Type-C cable so it can receive the data signal, uh, display signal, and the power at the same time, okay? And it does come included with this stand and cover. And there you can see the different orientations. The other cool thing too is that there's a built-in sensor here. A sensor will actually automatically dim the screen because with uh, an uh, organic light emissive based display, you do actually have to account for lifespan and some other factors there. So to help to kind of maximize the lifespan of this uh, panel, it automatically will essentially dim when it doesn't have det detection of presence in front of it. And then when you come back, it will automatically kind of uh, turn back on if that makes sense, right? And there, as I noted right there, I was talking about where you have, you, of course, the USB-C and display alt support on this side as well on this side. And then you've got the mini HDMI on this side, and then you've got the USB-C for power on this side. So keep in mind, again, for that USB-C, this one and this one, they both can provide the data signal. So essentially the display and the power simultaneously. But if you're going to, let's say, like uh, an HDMI enabled device, like a mirrorless camera or something like that, then that would be using the mini HDMI and then you would provide the power. And you get all the accessories inside the box. So mini HDMI, USB-C, the power adapter, the smart case, and then the actual box itself, which is actually makes that cool little monitor hood. So all of that comes in there. Okay, so that takes care of the MB. Uh, let me just see right there. Um, do you sell the stand separately? So I'm assuming you're talking about that little tripod stand. For this one, we may sell it. Um, uh, normally in the past, we've usually had like a bundled version. So one that came with it and one that didn't. Here, we do not sell it right now at this, at this time, but we're gonna be collecting feedback to see how many people want it. Um, just because it's already at 399, I think that we didn't wanna add the additional cost in terms of also including the stand because the stand's actually a pretty nice stand. It's fully made out of metal. It actually has an articulated head on it. There's a lot of nice things about it, but it would probably have add almost maybe I think about $50. So that's part of the reason why we didn't include it. Um, but you know, if we get feedback from people, then that definitely is something that we could be looking at. Uh, Michael's asking is, uh, Asus going to jump into the queue of the OLED? We're evaluating it. I mean, you know, we are the number one gaming, uh, monitor manufacturer. And then, you know, of course we're a leading manufacturer and across all of our other displays, whether we talk about our pro art series displays, or we talk about, of course, our standard Asus series displays. And, you know, we don't limit ourselves to just one panel technology, everything from, of course, um, you know, partners like AU Optics, right, that we've utilized, you know, LG that we've worked with, right, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, VA, IPS, um, or OLED, we're always looking at what's the technology that helps to best serve the target that we're looking at, right? And so QD OLED offers some really impressive features, but there's also still reasons why a traditional IPS or IPS-like display or even a W OLED can actually still provide benefits compared to an OLED, right? So there's a lot of different factors to evaluate and we are evaluating QD OLED. As far as anything specifically, nothing to talk about, but you know we have a very, very diverse stack right now when it comes to uh, the different monitors that we offer. Hey, Jurgen, happy to have you here, man. Thanks so much for joining us on the stream here. Um, Pushing Polygon says, looks like a great monitor for a mobile camera display to make sure things are focused. Yeah, this would be great. Of course, we have already very color accurate IPS mobile based displays, uh, which could work for this, including our PA series, which all even have touch. I really like the touch centric ones too, because then of course you can do stuff like pinch and zoom and things along those lines. Sam H is saying is that when will the Rampage Extreme Mobile return? Well, Rampage is generally reserved for HEDT platforms, so high enthusiast desktop platforms. Since there haven't been any new high end enthusiast desktop platforms, there haven't been any Rampage series. There's only been Maximus series. So, and until we see probably another enthusiast 
kind of uh, overclock centric um, platform, you probably wouldn't see another Rampage series motherboard. Eric is asking, uh, what about upcoming OLED ProArt monitors? So we've already actually launched recently an OLED ProArt monitor, and we do have another, I believe, two coming this year. So make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned. We've got some more OLED coming. Okay. All right. Very, very cool. Uh, let me see right here. Um, is there a way to mount that on a vest stand? I like the white one, 144 megs for the white build. Uh, that'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, you know, people looking always for kind of creative ways how to use these different type of displays, right? All right, so uh, let's go ahead and just finish up the last set of products that we've got right here, and we're going to get ready to go into our PC DIY Builder Spotlight just here in a little bit. Um, so we've got one other basic monitor right here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because this is just a very entry-level monitor, really focused for somebody if they're just looking for maybe a, a replacement. Maybe you've got you know, a 10-year-old monitor and you just need something to get back up and running. Uh, maybe it's there for you know corner office or just you know basic purposes. This is um, one of the cheapest monitors that we're going to be offering at $104 right here. This is the VP227HE. It's 21.5 inches. It's 1080p base display. Again, Nothing crazy in terms of its overall core specifications right here. About the only thing that it's probably a little bit outside of the norm is this is a does actually, I believe, support up to 75 hertz. Again, it's not a gaming-based display, but this is going to give you a little bit of a smoother experience when you're in the desktop environment, which is kind of nice. So um, let me go ahead and just pop that up right here. Of course, you'll see, so no, 21.45 inch, 75 hertz, adaptive sync. Of course, you have Visa mount support, um, and then... You know, basic connectivity is going to be available on there. It does have thinner bezels. So, of course, if you've got one of those older monitors and you have, you know, really thick bezels and maybe also a little bit of a smaller environment, a very small office, then this could actually work really nicely for you to where you can just go ahead and put these, you know, two side by side and have some additional kind of productivity. Although you could also say maybe you would want to go with one of you like our 29 ultra wides, which would just give you one big one. But then you also have to deal with non-standard resolutions, which sometimes can be frustrating for some people. Uh, but again, very low price point, $105 essentially here for this monitor, right? Um, then next up here, we've got one other update, which will be for the HE, I believe, yeah. This is going to be for the VA, which would be for a 23.8 inch, so essentially about a 24 inch monitor, 75 hertz as well, uh, supports adaptive sync, a force piece of mounting support, also thin bezel, and then a more traditional base that would be on this monitor, right, with a little bit of a higher height too as well. This would also, like I said, be a very good option if you're looking for kind of just general productivity. Again, this is not like I'd say... Um, anything like our ProArt series or our gaming series based displays. But if you're just looking for a basic monitor, this can definitely give you covered. Another thing to also keep in mind is that people forget not only for these monitors, but for our also ProArt and for our gaming based displays, a lot of manufacturers, they might only offer a standard kind of one year warranty. Uh, we offer a three year warranty, which has different levels of coverage inclusive within that three years, uh, as well as ASUS rapid replacement. And if you compare that to some other companies, it's actually quite a bit better. Uh, there's also going to be things like uh, we openly disclose our zero bright dot pixel palette. Policy. Um, Samsung and LG do not even openly disclose a, a, a zero bright dot policy. So at least you actually have specific criteria that's noted as far as what's coverage in that, in that respect, right? So that gives you uh, just some more insight there. All right. Lastly, I've got something that's cool and it's a little bit different here. Uh, this might be something that you wouldn't expect from us, but I think it's pretty cool. So I want to go ahead and show it off. Um, let's go ahead and take a look right here. This is going to be a limited edition item. Um, it will be coming out in the not too distant future. And uh, it's a special collaboration that we're having with Spalding. So if you're maybe uh, you like pl playing basketball, actually, I liked playing basketball for a really long time. Um, and it's, I think, a really cool accessory. It's got a really kind of cool design to it, too, where you've got this kind of black this faux snake skin kind of a patterning to it. And then of course you've got the ROG design aesthetics that are gonna be on there. It does actually come included with the drawstring bag. And then it also comes included with the little base right there. This will be something that you can go ahead and pick up. It's gonna be coming in $129.99. So in the not too distant future, you'll actually be able to pick one of these up. Um, let's go just through quickly a little bit on the uh, images right here for this guy. And I believe this will be exclusive to the ASUS eStore. So um, it will only be available, I believe, on the ASUS eStore. So uh, if you guys are following me in the PCDIY group, I'll make sure to do a post when it's actually been listed. And again, it will have a limited edition production. I don't know yet exactly the production run, but I know it's actually going to be pretty small. So it's not going to be something that will be available for a very long period of time.
I think it's really cool. I love that little throwback right there, right? Established 2006 for the inception of when ROG first started. And again, you it comes included with the draw sting and the little display mount for the basketball. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, so that covers that. Let me go ahead and just see if we got any questions here before we get ready to go into the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, guys. So, wow, a lot of questions that came in right there. Um, let's see. Miguel says, I want three of those. Wow, that would be pretty crazy. Um, Michael saying was, when will the U.S. product page uh, for the AP201 be launched? Um, actually, I double checked with our team. I think actually it should already be up. Let me go ahead and check here. Yeah, uh, Michael, the product page is already up right here, and you can see that it's already up. This is the AP201. This is the US-based product page. So we do already have it up. Um, generally, anything that I'm announcing here on the stream is in alignment with North America, because while we have people viewing us from all parts of the world, I focus only on North America. So that's going to be for Canada and the United States. So when I'm talking about a product, it means it's in alignment with whatever we're doing in terms of channel release availability. So um, in that respect, yeah, the, this, this is already active. It's already online right now. And I will drop that there in the chat. I thought I already dropped it in there, but I will go ahead and drop it in there. Um, where do you guys ship your panels? I'm not sure what you mean in terms of question of that. So if you can go ahead and maybe clarify, I can try to see if I can give you a better response. <laughs> H2O is just saying, are you trying to get us outside? Hey, you know what? Not everybody follows that mantra, right? Of, you know, being quote unquote, that quintessential person that's just stuck inside their house, right? You know, I know a lot of us have been in, in and out of lockdowns, right? But, you know, uh, maybe you're lucky enough to maybe have a little bit of space out around your house that you can maybe go ahead and take a, a quick jump into and maybe enjoy, a, you know, a couple of a uh, couple sessions in terms of enjoying a little bit of basketball, a little bit of hoops, right? That's interesting. Preston's asking is, I would really love a more sedated PC case. Will you offer a business type ROG case? I don't think so, because that probably really doesn't align with the aesthetic. Although I will say the re refined aesthetic that we have for high-end ROG, I think is quite clean and white, quite premium feeling, right? And it's not as edgy as we have with like ROG Strix. So I wouldn't say that it's actually out of the norm to have something that could be really kind of polished and minimal, uh, let's say from that. I will tell you though, that we are looking at having some other potential chassis products, right? So potentially something under our pro art line, which could maybe be complementary to having something that would be really clean, like in a business calculated fashion that you could put something inside of. Um, the question though, is that would then that meet kind of the enthusiast expectations that an ROG user might have? And that's where kind of there's an interesting balancing act of trying to kind of keep that in mind. But I definitely would say never say never. Um, you know, we're going to continue to collect feedback and I think continue to see where there's an opportunity for us to open up our product lines in alignment with what the community is asking for, right? So we've got tons of amazing partners that make ch chassis, right? You know, from Cooler Master to Fantex to Leanne Lee to Thermal Take, right? Um, so many of them are out there. And so our goal isn't necessary to compete with them. I think one, when we first entered into the chassis market, it was because we had people that were asking for a unified experience. So they wanted to be able to kind of have an entirety of an Asus and RG experience was one. And then two, as always, I think Asus brings ingenuity and creativity to the products it designs. So I think we wanted to bring about things that were distinctive and cool. And so I would actually agree that maybe we could do something kind of really interesting. I know we've talked with our team actually about using different types of materials in terms of actually the um, materials that are designed for the chassis. Um, having modular design interfaces and interconnects could also be something really cool. Like we've looked at things like fiber optic ACE interface cables for the motherboard in relation to the chassis. So you can imagine like a single cable that runs from the motherboard to just the chassis and bypasses any cables that you have to have. And then that could be interfaced into a one touch button that you could have for controlling things like the fans, powering on the system, giving you your readout information, a lot of really interesting things that we can do as being the board manufacturer and the chassis manufacturer, right? So there's, I think, a lot of things that we're envisioning as we continue to move forward. So, um, you know, ne never say never, right? All right. Sneff says he definitely wants one. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Nelson's asking, the RGB item uh, behind you on top of the PC case, is that a GPU sand? Yes, this one right here. Yes, this is actually a, uh, yes, this is the ROG Herculex. So yeah, we have three, three actually graphics card holders. There's this one, the Herculex. Then there's the wing wall, uh, which is metal. And it's actually more of a traditional one. This one is a little bit different because you can see right here. Well, you can't see it. I mean, I could show it to you on the secondary cam, but um, there's actually a little, 
a bit of a button right here so you can see how it, it rises there we go now we're even make it cooler right <laughs> there you go right um but it, it can go ahead and uh, adjust up and down right so yes it is a it is a graphics card holder and it is available you can buy it right now it's on it's on amazon it's on newegg Michael, I can't talk about anything that we have potentially under design and development for anything that may be in the future for graphics cards. Um, so you just have to keep it tuned, all right? Uh, anything in terms of 10 gigabit? I mean, uh, you know, we're always taking a look at trying to make sure that we can have as many products uh, with high speed based interconnects, especially because we're a leading networking manufacturer, right? But, you know, a challenge with 10 gig is 10 gig is really expensive. Um, in terms of the cost. And then the reality is that the deployment installation environment is quite small, right? Only a small number of users have spent the money to adopt into one either ISP services that can benefit from 10 gig. That's getting better, especially now in North America with AT&T and companies now rolling out multi-gig services, especially in 2022. Um, but then there's also the challenge of switches and routers, right? We've only recently started over the last couple of years to put that in and the adoption rate is still fairly small. So it becomes kind of this balancing act of like, okay, chicken and egg type of scenario, right? You can put 10 gig on a motherboard, but then does the user have a switch? Does they have a router? You know, how can they really try to benefit from the entirety of that, right? So there's um, different things to keep in mind. Uh, Eric is saying, will Eva edition stuff be discounted? I'm not sure what you mean by that. It's brand new and it's limited edition. So there's definitely not gonna be any discounts, but I can tell you that pretty much once it's gone, it's gonna be gone. It's gonna be a limited production. And a lot of times what I've seen, especially with the Gundam is that actually the price went up sometimes because uh, after it was no longer in production, there were people that were selling it, um, you know, trying to essentially get a little bit more than that. I can't make any comments on anything from the series, but I can tell you as somebody that helped to actually develop the original Gene series, uh, that and any high performance um, kind of small form factor um, based kind of design concepts are something that are near and dear to me. But the reality is micro ATX is a smaller share of the market than even kind of uh, mini ITX and micro ATX are very, very small. And keep in mind, we're the world's largest motherboard manufacturer. And so it's a challenge to put in a lot of design investment into smaller form factor boards because of the complexity um, that they take. When you talk about developing these boards, especially high-end enthusiast boards, we're not talking about basic motherboards. Like right now, we have a really, really high-end um, micro ATX board that yes, it's not a gene series, but let's look at the Z690G, um, which this is a fantastic motherboard. Um, in terms of its overall feature set, and it's very high performance. And I remember pushing our team to get this one done. Um, and this is my great text, but the reality is that the adoption is gonna be small. It's just not that much. The lion's share of the market is in ATX, and that's the reason why there's so many SKUs. Um, there's a lot more variation in price point. And a lot of this is also in alignment with not only just price, but ease of the building experience. You've also had chassis become smaller. You can get very compact ATX based chassis. And then visually, the trend for aesthetics has favored ATX and not micro ATX and mini ITX, which the reality is the smaller you make them, it becomes more challenging to see anything. The system in itself really just becomes the system. Like if you take a look at some really cool small form factor builds that we've shown here, they look really cool, but it's a small, just metal box, right? So aesthetically, they don't show off all the hardware. And especially within the RGB era, ATX has really been where the proponent of the focus has been in within visibility. But, you know, definitely we still continue to talk to our team, monitor the community for feedback. And I never say never. If, if we can get enough people to affirm that they're saying that they're interested in that SKU, I think our teams will look at it. But, you know, design and development time alone, again, a normal ATX based motherboard is probably going to talk to you about maybe six months approximately maybe a little bit more. Um, and then you get into high performance micro ATX and mini ATX, and you could be talking, you know, eight months plus, maybe even 10 months in terms of design work. So it's more time resource incentive for a smaller share of the market, a significantly smaller share of the market, right? And so that has to be justified because it can become quite challenging. And also for us, there's an expectation, right? We're not interested in making um, a very entry-based solution because so many people, they're like, I want all these really great features, but now you just added all this design complexity to it, right? So it becomes really, really challenging, okay? All right. Okay, all right. So let's get ready to jump into the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, guys, here. So give me one second to go ahead and bring up the builds. We've got a lot of builds. Um, so I don't know how many I'm gonna be able to get to, but we'll see if I, we can hopefully at least get through a few here, okay? Uh, give me one second here. Let me just see. Um, Andy Kane is saying, 
when will it be available in Europe? I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you. Um, just because um, Asus, you know, is independently operated. And when it comes to each region, they have their own product matrix, um, and you know, availability and pricing varies. So, uh, depending on where you're at in Europe, you would actually want to reach out to Asus in your region. Uh, use the contact us option on their webpage, right? And they would be able to tell issue you know. So, an example of like you were in Germany, you know. Uh, actually reach out to Asus Germany, look at the contact us and ask them, you know, what's the expected availability or if they're even going to carry the product, because in some regions they may not bring in the product because maybe there's not enough demand or, you know, there could be different factors as to why they're not deciding to bring in the product. Okay. Um, pushing polygons is saying, has Asus considered making a Halo type Super ATX chassis? Um, yeah, so I mean, the Helios is already a very kind of high end based chassis, uh, but we actually have a kind of bigger version, a more specialized version of actually the Helios that we are going to be releasing, which is a more of an open frame X concept. It has very specialized lighting. Um, don't think it's going to be released this year, probably going to be early next year, but we do have kind of, I think, even a more specialized kind of cool, full large system. It's really been designed to be more open, um, uh, more dynamic looking, um, and be kind of, I think, really focused for even water cooling enthusiasts to a whole nother level where the current Helios is already great for water cooling, but um, this one will definitely, I think, look to kind of be in addition to that. It won't replace the Helios, but it will supplement the current lineup. Okay. Oh, and Ireland. Oh, fantastic. That's very cool, man. Well, thanks for joining us all the way from Ireland. Okay. Um, Alexander's asking, why didn't uh, we put DisplayPort on the motherboard? That's pretty rare. And also there's a lot of cost and complexity to that interface connector. You almost never put DisplayPort on the motherboard. But keep in mind, we already support DisplayPort over Type-C. So you have the Type-C cable that you would attach to the back of the motherboard. And uh, that cable can then go out to a DisplayPort connection. But most users are going to not find this relevant because the reality is they're going to use a discrete graphics card, which will display, which will have the display ports on them, right? And, you know, the really only reason why you would have the integrated graphics there for just basic test bed functionality or a secondary display. So uh, the kind of the requirement, especially too, because you also usually to have auxiliary um, display out, you actually have to have certain hardware componentry that you build on the motherboard, not only in terms of uh, the display output functionality, but there's even some power delivery components you have to put on the motherboard actually add some complexity. And this is the reason why like when we have more specialized SKUs, we'll actually even remove that entirely and use that space so that we can maximize the focus on other areas of the board, right? So it's always a balancing act of trying to give value to certain specs um, while not necessarily limiting the design um, in one direction or the other, right? So it's just a little bit of kind of a factor right there, right? Okay. All right, uh, so let's get ready to jump into the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, guys. So for those of you that are checking this out for the first time and you're not aware, uh, with the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, this is where we'd love to be able to showcase your guys' PC builds from the community. It's a great way to be able to go ahead and show off the work that you've done if you put together an ACU-based system. If you're interested in submitting, all you got to do is be part of our PC DIY group and go ahead and submit on that Google form that we've got there, and you can go ahead and be featured here on the ACU's PC DIY stream, as well as actually on our ACU social media channels and our ACU's. Asus PC DIY website. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what we've got. We've got a lot of submissions. So we're going to see uh, what I can fit in uh, for today. So let me go ahead and see what we got going on. Um, oh, we've got a lot right here. Okay. Um, let me see here. Is this here? It looks like the first one, there's going to be no name. And I'm going to need to look at the submission form to try to hopefully be able to pronounce this individual's name. So Go ahead and let me just put this right here. All right, so let's see here. Um, this is a pretty cool build. We're going to be starting it off with a water cooled base build right here. And builder, I'm going to apologize. I do not know how to pronounce your name, so I'm just going to give you credit here on the screen. And I'm going to try, do my homework here and see if I can figure out uh, how to pronounce that. But let's go ahead and take a look at your amazing system right here that you've gone ahead and submitted. So this is pretty cool. So um, we're going to see right here, first and foremost, we've got a pretty amazing setup. Um, really clean. Uh, this is an L-type desk. That's one of my favorite type of desk configurations. I actually see type of desk setup that actually I run. Um, and you can see they've got, of course, a multi-monitor configuration right there. You, of course, got your Pugio. I'm loving that. Puja is one of my favorite mice right there. Got an RGB desk mat. And then you can see they got their system all right there. Nothing else on that desk. It's just that monitor 
their gaming setup in terms of their peripherals, and then that full system. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this build. Oh, this looks pretty sweet. So um, we can see right there that we've got with a big open system. So these are actually some of the most challenging builds to work within. Part of the reason being is that when you deal with such a system so big, it can be hard to kind of figure out how to fill the space, right? Um, it's deceptive. Sometimes people think building in a big system is easy, but actually it can be sometimes the hardest to do. Building in a small system can be challenging because of the constraint, but building in a big system to make it fit visually can actually be quite tricky. So you actually want to fill out how you can balance everything out. And this is quite nicely done. So we can see right here, of course, they've filled out everything in terms of all the fans. And this is interesting. It's only almost in these type of systems where technically here you could use only two fans, right? This supports up to four hands. But if you had only two fans, it would probably look weird, right? Um, or some people would think it would look weird. And this is what I mean where sometimes with these systems, you have to almost kind of go all or nothing, right, in terms of kind of the approach. So we can see it's been decked out in terms of everything. They've gone with, of course, the vertical orientation, which as some of you guys know, I'm always you know, in between about in terms of how I feel, but I think overall it's come through strong in terms of being visually cohesive with the rest of the system. We've got some nice kind of foreground and background in terms of the overall layout, clean and nice cable management. I love the UV reactive pop to it. It looks really, really cool. Um, giving us a separate angle right there. Of course, we can see the massive distro that we've got in there, tying it together in nice, clean runs. Um, you know, I like this overall layout. It's not bad. You know, sometimes with distro plates, it's a little bit too heavy in terms of having too many perpendicular lines, but some nice, clean symmetry going on here. These little bends right here, right here, they look pretty clean, pretty well done. Nice, just kind of clean routing right here, going straight into, of course, the monoblock that we've got right there. And then, of course, going to the GPU. So overall, nothing to gate on here. This is really cleanly done, nicely laid out, good use of space. Color theme is on point. It's overall a really nice, just uh, high performance, water cooled base build. So you can see right here, we've got a Strix board. I love the choice that they went with keeping kind of the black there in the back to be able to kind of give you a nice kind of base and then have that pop with, of course, the UV. You can see here, they've also got a mono block on the Strix board. So that means they're covering the VRM and the CPU. It's not critical, but it looks cool because it helps to just expand upon the visual of how much of the coolant you're seeing in terms of that UV effect. So that's pretty coolly done. And again, while I generally favor a horizontal mount as opposed to a vertical mount, this is where I think kind of the cohesiveness of the design comes through as well. As so we can see right here, we've got, of course, the coolant, which is almost kind of being fed right in into the bottom for the uh, GPU block. So it's got a really kind of nice, consistent look and feel in that top and then that bottom kind of scenario right there. And then, of course, there on the back, of course, we've got a little bit of that loop kind of flowing in there as well. It's nicely done. So uh, let's see some feedback right here from the community. Um, we've got simple and beautiful. Uh, Stevens gives us a wow P9. Actually, yes, it's a, it's a P8. Um, <laughs> I'm throwing my $10,000 setup in the trash. Don't do that, man. Don't do that. We got to all be proud of our systems. Uh, Michael says some nice bends uh, looking pretty, pretty cool. Uh, Michael, Michael, you should definitely submit your build, man. Uh, I'd love to be able to see your system and see what it looks like. So that would be pretty cool. So let's go ahead and just finish giving this a round out. Overall, nicely done in terms of also managing these cables. These systems are a little bit hard in terms of actually getting the cable management cleanly done so where you don't see anything. And you can even see looking at some of the outer angles, really nicely cleanly done. You can see they tightened it up, even going with cable ties right in here to pull through the rubber grommets, right? And the actual access points on the chassis. The bridge combs also keep those things nice and tight and clean. So overall, really nicely done. I'm wondering where their drain port is. That's always what I like to kind of see, and I, I don't know where the drain port is at, but overall, it's a fantastic looking build, clean, well executed. I got nothing to gate on here. It's nicely done. And like I said, even gets a nice thumbs up for me in regards to actually the choice to go with the vertical. I think the vertical looks good. Um, let me go ahead and, sorry, bring up their submission form. And uh, we will keep checking this along. So got their submission form there and Sorry, one sec. Okay, so let me see here. Um, see, it's not a sponsored build. It wasn't their first build. Does the build have a theme? There was actually no theme. At least the builder says that there was no theme. To me, it's pretty cohesive and pretty uh, consistent in terms of the overall look and feel. So it does feel like there was a purposeful design aesthetic. Three words to describe the build is dope, minimalistic, and powerful. I think definitely it is a powerful looking build. Minimalistic? 
I think, yeah, I mean, definitely very clean. You don't see an over kind of complexity and everything. So I, I could see how somebody could interpret it in terms of minimalistic and dope. If you consider dope a good thing in terms of his vernacular right there, I think it works. So I think we'll definitely go and say that looks well. Um, let's see. Does the build have a name? There's no name for it. In terms of the hardware, what we got here, we've got a Ryzen 7 5800X, and that's all on an ROG Strix X570-E board. He's also got that Tough 3080 card that's in there that's going to, of course, be blocked and water-cooled. So that's a great combination in terms of performance. 1,000-watt power supply with custom cables. Uh, he's got there quite a number of SSDs. He's got WDAC 500 gig, another 500 gig 970. He's also got a, a HyperX uh, 240 gigabyte SAT SSD and then a two terabyte HDD and a one terabyte HDD and then another one terabyte SSD. So quite a bit, a little storage mixed in there. That's all inside of a core P8 uh, tempered glass. He's got 12 fans. Those are all thermal take, the ring trios. And then the water cooling hardware is predominantly pretty much almost all key, the uh, EK that we can see in there, right? So that's... Um, yeah, EK Coolstream S, uh, SE Race Radiators, the 480 millimeter variant, right, which makes, of course, sense to be able to fill everything out, the Tough Get Vector Block, and then, of course, the Pump and the Res Combo, and then, of course, the FLT Reservoirs. It's also EK Cryo Full Neon Green, and then, of course, you've also got the Mono Block for the CPU and for the VRM for the board. Um, and then uh, his keyboard was an RG Strict Scope TKL based keyboard and the Pugio mouse, uh, as far as the items. And then he actually custom made his desk. That's pretty cool. That L shaped desk that we saw at the beginning was all made by him. $6,000 total price point there for his build uh, in terms of the budget. Um, what is he most proud of? The miss minimalistic and the clean view. Is there anything would change about his build? Nope. Took him a few days to put it all together. He predominantly uses it for gaming. So Doom, Wolfenstein, and Metro are some of his favorite games and some of his favorite features on terms of Asus hardware. He's a big fan of Asus USB BIOS Flashback, Armory Crate, and GPU Tweak. And if you guys haven't checked out GPU Tweak, we recently launched GPU Tweak 3. So if you want to check it out, make sure to go check it out. It's been entirely overhauled, and it's a really cool way to be able to go ahead and monitor everything about your system. So I give that a thumbs up. It's a pretty cool... Pretty cool build, man. Um, let's see, yeah, digging the UV flow, very cool. Uh, very different using three reservoirs. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Yeah, thermal performance should be great on there. And I definitely think that one of the big benefits that you have right there is gonna, of course, be that he can probably run those fans. I'm guessing maybe something like a thousand RPM, uh, you know, so he can keep it really kind of just low, consistent, synced across all those fans. So pretty much you're gonna have just great, you know, acoustics, but of course uh, you got massive displacement. So it should be pretty sweet right there, all right? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here at our next build. Uh, next build is going to be here. This is from New Roll, I believe. Hopefully I'm saying that right. New Roll. And they're going to have uh, the, let's see, I think this is the White Trooper. All right, let's go ahead and take a look here. White Trooper. All right. Ooh, ah, this is interesting. All right, so we're going to definitely go to the other end of the spectrum in terms of going with something that's quite a bit smaller. So um, we can see here we're going for a very kind of compact base build, and we're going again with a vertical base mount. So that's probably the first thing that you notice. Um, they actually cool. They gave me actually different images. I always ask, if you can, give me an RGB on and RGB off because I like to be able to see kind of the difference. I really like the way this looks with actually no lighting. I think it looks really clean. The white's nice and consistent. I'm torn again, though. I mean, this chassis, of course, you're ideally suited to, of course, use that vertical mount. But I feel like I would have loved to see that nice white bar that we have in terms of the RG Strix card in that horizontal orientation. But maybe they really, really like, of course, this white aesthetic. And so they really want to show it off. So I get the vibe on wanting to go with the white theme right here. So we can see, of course, they've gone here uh, with the Arctic fans. Uh, and then we've also got Badar fans in there. So that's an interesting. So we have two different fans that are mixed up in there. And then, of course, we've got the Lan Lee chassis that's in there, too. So uh, here we can now see we've transitioned over into the RGB vibe. And what do you guys think? Do you like it no RGB lighting or with the RGB lighting? Now here, white is really reflective, so it gives you a lot of color play and allows the kind of colors to pop. I, white goes really well with rainbow, but I feel like I maybe would have vibed a little bit more with maybe a fixed color. So maybe blue or maybe like a gradient, maybe going to like blue, pink to purple or something like that, as opposed to the pure rainbow. I will say that ID pump housing for the ID cooling looks nice in there. 
Uh, interesting choice to not go with any RGB memory. Um, you know, so I don't know if they maybe were looking, thinking about maybe going with white dims or maybe some RGB that could give you another little point of contrast and pop, but it this definitely is all clean and well executed. I mean, you can't give any niggles right here. It's very tight amount of space and all the cables are nicely laid out. Um, it's well executed. Now, the bigger question would be of whether or not it would have made sense to try to give you a little bit of flexibility, maybe run the pump and cable right here down and then use only a 240 and mount it there, right? Versus going with the 360 up at top. Because the reality is if you're only gaming, you don't need the 360. So that's an interesting configuration is which one would have been the right one. Because then I think you would have been to play around with this cable a little bit more and maybe have it come out just a little bit cleaner. But it's still very nicely done. Very clean aesthetic. Oh, and there we go. So they actually gave us a nice blue. I think this is maybe my favorite. I like this more than the rainbow. I'm really liking that nice, soft, kind of light teal kind of blue right there uh, with the white. I think that looks perfect. It's got that little icy kind of vibe to it, a little bit of kind of hoth kind of vibe to it. White, white thruper is what they call it right there. So I might have called it something like hoth. I think this is cool. I definitely feel this vibe. I think this comes through nicely right here. So uh, Michael saying, yeah, the blue is nice. Um, then we've got the ice... Icebox looks. Uh, not digging the choice of the RGB colors. Something uh, to work better with the white. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we've got gray sense of unity right there. And overall, you can see very cleanly done. So I got no real, like I said, only thing I might have maybe changed up is, like I said, maybe going with the 240 mounted right here as opposed to going with the 360 and then going with the fans right there. I think that would have given a little bit of a vibe. And here's where you can see that you've got that beautiful light bar right now. It's kind of cool because you get to see a little bit of that just color right there at the top, which gives a little bit of a pop and a little bit difference. And actually, I like the little color play right there. But that's where I was saying that. Um, you know, that that vertical light bar is pretty cool. Now, we did to do a diffuse design here, so you get a little bit of that fill lighting right there um, that does kind of still come through. Oh, they gave us the cable management shot. Kudos for being brave and giving us everything right here. Um, great job. Nothing niggle on there. You really packed it in there. It's nicely, cleanly, well-managed. Um, you know, it's, everything is isolated out. You know, you can see right there, you've got your sets of lines running right there. It's clean, it's well laid out, and you're good to go, um, you know. I'm a little stickler for me. Usually I like to try to have something that helps me to know. So I might have like different color, like Velcro ties, excuse me, hook and loop fasteners um, so that I know whether I'm going to, you know, my PCI power for my graphics to my SATA to my fan controller or something like that. But otherwise, um, very clean and well executed. So uh, this gets a thumbs up for me. It's a great looking build. And I think definitely blue for me is my favorite. So we're going to go ahead and leave it right there in terms of uh, the overall kind of look and feel. Let's go ahead and see. So yeah, uh, Nural is the name of the builder right here. Uh, does the build have a theme? No, I built a white PC to look clean. Uh, I think a black PC can look equally clean. So I don't think white looks any quote unquote cleaner, uh, but definitely white does bring quite a bit of a brighter and kind of a more reflective type of ambience, right? Uh, what are three words uh, that you use to describe your build? White and clean. Um, and then does your build have a name? Is the white troper? I wonder if they mean white trooper or white troper, right? Uh, either which way, uh, totally cool. Um, so this interesting, this is a balance build. I like this. This is kind of where they're looking to maybe focus their budget to get really great performance, but without going crazy on the hardware. So um, this is an i5-12400, which is definitely one of the best CPUs you can get to price to performance. Outstanding part. Um, really almost won't be limited in terms of any type of scenario. And you can pair that up with everything to like a 3090, 3090 Ti, 3080 Ti. B660 Strix board, which is another great choice. The D4 variant, right? Um, then a 3080. RG Strix card, wide edition. And then he's got Cleb Bolt XR, 16 gigabytes of memory that's in there, 3600 MT. And then the ID cooling Zoom Flow, 360 XT Snow RGB cooler. Uh, he then has, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four. He's got eight terabytes of total space in there. So he's got four one terabyte drives and then a four terabyte SATA drive. Um, so uh, the PCI NVMe make up multiple drives and then that one single four terabyte SATA drive. Then he's got the EK Vidar fans, the 120 Evo whites, and then two pieces of the Arctic Cooley PWM set. Um, and then that's all powered by an, a Landly SP750 uh, power supply. And that's all inside of the Landly O11 Dynamic, right? Uh, the mini edition. $3,000 for his build. What is he most proud of? The overall, the art of building a PC. Is there anything you would change about the build? Not for now. 
how long did it take him to put it all together? About six months because he had to, of course, save that money to be able to get together his build. And then he uses it for gaming. So um, predominantly likes to play, um, let's see, Battlefield, some Forza. Forza 4, Forza 5, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Grand Theft Auto, a classic. And then uh, he actually uses it also for his general productivity. So he's learning to actually use Photoshop and Premiere as well. And he's a big fan of Armory Crate to be able to kind of tweak and tune and monitor his system. And of course, be able to take advantage of RGB lighting customization. And he also uses GPU Tweak for managing and monitoring his graphics card. Well, New Roll, man, great build, solid job. All right, very, very cool. All right, so let's go ahead and go with the next one. Let's see what we got for our next build. <clears throat> mm, do, 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 do. All right. Um, ooh, all right, let's go, let's go with this one. This is gonna be pretty, another no-name build. We're going with another water build here. So, oh, let me switch this up because usually I put NA for the no name. All right. So this is going to be by Jim, Jim Frederick, I believe, is hopefully I'm saying that correctly. All right. And let's go ahead and take a look and see what we've got going on right here. Ooh, very interesting. Ooh, I like this kind of like almost industrial kind of vibe here with the metal. Uh, and actually, this I don't think this is, uh, well, it's metal, but it's aluminum, not steel. Um, and then we can see up here, look, look, interesting up here. Look at this, what we got going on. We got an external rad, which is kind of cool. Always interesting when we're playing around with kind of the positioning for the way things are laid out. So that's actually pretty cool in terms of that. Okay. And then let's go ahead and see. So um, this is also really cool. I really dig in the actual split color vibe. So we've got red and then we've got the blue. That's really cool in terms of how that's actually been laid out. So that's very interesting and quite dynamic in there. And then, oh, it's an interesting choice here. Look, this is a throwback. This is the Corsair air cooling kit. I think for, we'd have to go back quite a bit in terms of the dims that were sold with these air cooling kits, or you could buy them uh, externally, but this is an interesting choice right here. Um, I don't know if they're using it to cool the Dim.2 adding card or exactly what they've got going in there. They've got a multi GPU setup, which is also interesting. And then a massive 1600 watt power supply. And then we can see right here, this is looking like this is probably the glacial board right there, right? So. Uh, this is pretty interesting. So let's go on the inside here. And then now we can see here, there's a lot that's going on. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we've got the Maximus Extreme Glacial right there. So that's our flagship series Intel board, right? Where that's got not what even is called a monoblock. It's called the ultra block. So the ultra block is a full custom block that we designed with EK that covers the pretty much all the motherboard it covers the cpu it covers the vrm it covers the actual lan um it covers actually m.2 it covers and then it goes all the way down here into the pch so it's one massive block i think total collective time in terms of production to just produce one ultra block is something like 10 to 12 hours or something like that it's pretty crazy in terms of the amount of work that goes through on actually getting this integrated here and then we've got multi-GPU uh, set up in there. And then, of course, we've got our pump and res. We've got two of them right here. So we've got the blue and then we have the red. I did like the time they took to be able to go ahead and isolate this and still kind of give some centralized visibility to a key portion of the board. Um, and so that's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and keep clicking along. And then, of course, we can see this all now fully locked in and situated and now lit up. And so it's got a really cool just kind of different vibe, almost kind of like a machine system right like something that's like industrial that's kind of working right it doesn't necessarily kind of give you pc vibe which is kind of cool um the cables are really cleanly and really well done and going actually with the custom the same cables right the system comes with these are really well managed and cleanly laid out i think some people would probably prefer to see a custom cable right there maybe something that wouldn't be as sharp as the nylon based cables right which are a little bit shinier um, but I think still think this is really cleanly done. And there is benefit to going with the original cables. The original cables are factory validated for the best efficiency. Sometimes if people use custom extensions, um, you can get less efficiency unless you're getting ones at a shorter length, which would be ideal. Um, but overall, it's really cleanly done, really nicely laid out, well managed in terms of the cables. We can see that there is some red cabling over here. So that's interesting why this cable didn't carry over onto this side, right? Um, but otherwise, 
it's really cool i love over right here look look we got easy access right here this is nice done i like that layout choice and just some nice clean layout options right here so very very cool i like this yeah it's overall a very cool, dynamic, and definitely a high performance based system. And definitely tons of displacement that you have here. The only question mark, of course, is with these Landly fans, they're maybe not the optimal choice for having, you know, massive amounts of static pressure. Um, but, you know, still really, really solid in terms of the overall um, kind of layout and the configuration. And you can see massive rad. I mean, remember the, the rad right there. We've got another rad down there. And then we've got the rad right there with all those fans. So tons of cable work that went into this system. So let's go ahead and uh, bring up the submission form for this guy. So give me a second here. Um, and I mean, also, let's, well, let's like first second second on the community comment here, Harry. Exactly the machine. Um, looks like it belongs in a lab. Uh, Kevin Havens is saying, I've read SLI, um, doesn't really support any game card, just still support, but best to get the best TV you can. Yes, that would be correct. Generally, SLI is not a primary focus anymore in terms of kind of current systems as uh, driver optimization and development for most game developers is fairly non-existent, right? Um, HTO Computer says, it's a super industrial look. Uh, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look here at his submission form. All right, so submission form. This is from Jim Frederick. Um, and uh, does the build have a theme? No. Three words to describe the build. Over the top. <laughs> I would definitely say over the top. Does your build have a name? There was no name. In terms of the hardware, as I noted, yeah, this is going to be um, pretty much peak hardware, right? So we've got a, a Z690 Glacial board. We have one of my favorite cases and one of my favorite manufacturers of all time with Case Labs. Sadly, they're no longer uh, present, but I know that actually I believe they purchased were purchased in terms of actually uh, one of the water cooling companies, I think, is actually picking them up and doing some stuff right uh, with them. But this is with the SM8, which was really one of the most amazing chassis in terms of having a huge amount of flexibility to be able to customize for different water cooling configurations. It's got a 12900KS um, bind. Uh, in terms of uh, the actual K912 KS, and then two 3090 base graphics cords, of course, water blocked on there, 32 gigabytes of memory uh, that he has on there in that two DIM configuration. So he's maximizing DRAM scaling 6400 MT, and then he's got uh, four two terabyte 980 drives in there, um, plus six terabyte. Um, a drive and then singularity res pump and mounts and then uh 480 of course rad that's in there a 240 rad and a 360 rad 18 lian lee uni fans and then an ax 1600 watt power supply um, budget for this build was uh, unlimited, essentially $10,000 plus. Uh, he was absolutely most proud of being able to actually get the Maximus Extreme Glacial Board to be able to make this build. Is there anything they would change about this build? He's going to be upgrading to the next generation NVIDIA graphics cards when they come out. How long did it take him to put together the system? About three months. It's uh, used uh, for gaming and for overclocking. He loves to play Biomutant, Forza, Dying Light 2, Shadow the Tomb Raider, Sekiro, uh, what's his overall favorite Asus function or feature? He's a huge fan of the way that Asus yeah, overclocking works. It's extremely solid. It's robust and really allows to have a great experience. He also really likes the anime matrix display on the glacial to be able to go ahead and customize and show off some cool elements for the actual system. Overall, man, thumbs up. It's a monster build. It's really cool and it's really distinctive, especially with so many people sometimes using the same chassis, same layouts. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things is to be able to actually see the time and effort to be able to put in something like this that has a distinguished kind of distinctive design aesthetic to it. Um, that's clean, well laid out, right? Has a thoughtful purpose that even though there wasn't a theme, I definitely feel that it comes across uh, with a distinctive look and feel um, that is really cool. So overall, it gets a thumbs up from me. Oh, yeah. Tim says, yeah, thank you, JJ, for doing uh, the PC show. Yeah, of course, man. We'd love to be able to do it. Yeah, so uh, HO Computer says, yeah, uh, they're uh, rebuilt, rebranded, I heard as well. Yes, Case Labs. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's go ahead, and we've got a couple more that we're going to probably try to see if we can get through here before we wrap things up. So let's go and go into it. We had a lot of submissions, um, so I don't know how many we're going to be able to uh, finish up with today, but uh, let's, let's get into at least a couple of others. Um, so let me go ahead and see what, what else we got in here. Mm, what are we going to go with? What are we going to go? Let me see. 
We got some good ones. Ooh, that's a cool Helios. Uh, oh, we got Sneff, the master class. You know, guys, you know, when Sneff sends something over, I got to I gotta take a look at it. Ooh, that one's pretty cool. God, Ben's. Oh, man, there's so, so many good, so many amazing builds from so many people. Let's let's go with something a little different, though. Let's go with uh, this one is pretty cool. So we're going to go with some Star Wars uh, from Italian Extreme Modders. This is a pretty sweet one. Um, T, uh, you know, Team IEM, some of the absolute best modders and builders out there. They always, I think, have really, really fun and interesting kind of dynamic builds in terms of what they do, in terms of their overall kind of look and feel. So always really cool to be able to kind of show off what they're doing. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Oh, all right. This is pretty cool. So um, we can see right off the bat, you guys already know exactly what we're looking at right here, right? This is going to be um, Star Wars themed, right? And um, beautiful paint job right off on the bat, right? So you can see that you've got, of course, full customization to the entirety of the chassis to be able to bring home the theme. Um, it's, of course, a Stormtrooper theme, Star Wars theme. I love the color combination right here between the red the white and the black, they all look really, really cool, really complimentary. And I really actually like the choice here to not block the card. Um, so this is a really cool kind of choice here to have that black for the board, then have that really nice vibrant red pop with the water cooling on the block. But then you kind of keep a little bit more of that kind of mechanical feel that you would have had uh, with the graphics card being present and then being vertically mounted. And so, and I actually like, again, the vertical mount choice here. It gives it a little bit of a distinguishing kind of um, vibe to it that you wouldn't have if you would have gone horizontal and you would have had maybe a little bit more depth and contrast to it. But I really actually like the way that this actually played out right here. So very, very cool. Um, different little background right here, changing it up, playing it around. And then Ooh, so we can definitely see we've got quite a bit of bits power in here. This bits power block is really cool. I like this block that they do where um, it's not a what's called like a mono block because it doesn't cover the VRM, but as opposed to their standard block, which just covers just the CPU, it's a little bit more elongated. So it takes up more of that space in the socket, um, which I think is kind of cool. And then it has a little bit RGB lighting. So I think that's a really kind of cool design aesthetic here with this bits power block. Then we can see we got the flow meter. And then we've got these individual. Uh, you can actually put a whole bunch of these together. This is actually a cool little way that they've actually laid these out. So that's pretty cool. And then just the nice clean runs there with the red, I think, really pops. And then, of course, you've got the red accents right here going throughout in terms of the lighting. Uh, it's a really cool just layout. You know, I mean, it's it's clean. It's well balanced. And like I said, thematically, they do such a great job so many times with their builds at having a cohesive look and feel that really drives home the kind of the vibe of what they're trying to achieve and the theme that they're trying to achieve. Right. Yeah, I love the way this turned out. It's clean. It's well executed. It's on point. There's nothing to niggle at here. I, I really just, again, they blew it out of the part. I think the last team I am we looked at is we looked at the Lamborghini one. Um, and that was absolutely, I think, fantastic. A really, really great, beautiful mod and build. Um, and this one, again, for me, is a fantastic, um, you know, mod and build right here. So let's go ahead. And I don't even know which way to leave it on because, like, you don't show that front part off. Yeah, let's go with that image. I think that one's pretty cool. You can, of course, still see some of the work right then there. But, uh, you know, then you lose out on that shot right there. So it's almost like, you know, you're always getting more when you're taking a look at it different places, right? So that's it right here. So this is a course from Italian Extreme Modders. Uh, of course, if you guys are not following them, make sure to go ahead and check them out. Facebook and Instagram. This was a sponsored base build. Does the build have a theme? Star Wars. Uh, three words to describe the build is Dark Side Clone, uh, Clones and Star Wars. And then build name. Uh, let me see. Sorry, does the build have a name? Um, attack of Star Wars Clones. Uh, <laughs> me, attack of Attack of Star Wars Clones, right? On the Inwin 915. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, so in terms of the core hardware, we got an ROG Strix B550-E gaming board in there, 5700X in terms of the actual uh, CPU, and then uh, ROG Strix 6650XT, that's cool. So this is a full AMD-based build, so you actually get kind of that optimal AMD experience, and then a custom loop, um, which is pretty much all powered by bits power in terms of the actual water cooling hardware, an A-Pacer SSD, as well as Zydac for the actual memory right there. About $4,000 for the build budget. 
what were they most proud of? The most important aspect is the complete airbrushing of the case, which I think, of course, yeah, the airbrushing just takes us to the next level. The rest of the stuff would look fantastic, right? And it would look great if it was just in a black theme, but the, the airbrush work is really what helps to evolve this and bring home, right, the entire kind of look and feel. Nothing they would change about the build. Three months in terms of the time and work, which doesn't surprise me, of course, especially with the custom artwork, right, that you've got there. It's being used for uh, 3D and, and gaming. And they're a huge fan of Armory Crate to just be able to go ahead and easily manage and monitor the system, especially when it comes to the RGB lighting. So overall, very, very cool. Uh, let me just go ahead and see. So yeah, the custom uh, work is outstanding. Uh, Paskowitz is saying, uh, JJ liking a vertical GPU setup. Are we in the upside down now? <laughs> um, nice that they used the Clone Trooper. Um, awesome build, right? Um, Let's see, uh, great use going with a chassis with a unique shape to match the Star Wars theme. Yeah, I think Paskowitz nailed it right here too, right? The shape here, because you have a little bit of those kind of rounded curvatures, really kind of complements the soft kind of rounded forms that you get within the kind of um, the look and feel of the clone troopers, right? So that's that's pretty cool right there too, right? So uh, very cool uh, for the Empire, right? And uh, feel the Star Wars love, yeah. Overall, very, very cool. Um, I love the way this turned out. It's It's a really cool build. All right, so let's go ahead and keep moving this along. Let's see if we can get two two more guys before we go ahead and wrap things up here. We had so many different builds, uh, just not going to be able to I, I get to all of them. But you know that's why we have the BC, PC Tower Builder Spotlight every week, right? All right. Um, oh, this is like oh, that's such a good one. I don't know what you wanted to go with. Uh, let's go with a little purple vibe and the heli. This one was pretty cool right here. All right, so give me one second here. And all right, so this is going to be from Joel. All right, so Joel, let's go ahead and take a look at his system right here. This is uh, going to be calling out. He is actually able to put together this system already in the ROG Evangelion Helios chassis. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look right here. I'm feeling it already. I absolutely love the way that the Helios looks in the ROG Evangelion based edition. It looks fantastic. Um, I love this, that green, that purple, and the black. It's a fantastic color combination. I think it looks so cool. And we can definitely see, and we can see we got a theme, uh, you know, uh, with actually, again, another vertical mount. And actually, it came through, I think, pretty cool. Again, I think it's all about theme execution. And here, I really like the vibe of having the actual green be that accent at that forefront, right? And we also create a little bit of foreground and background based kind of difference, which is a really cool way to be able to play the color theme. And I think it worked out really well. And this is where actually I think ideally you're using the vertical design in terms of its best suit, right? So you're using it as a focal point to then be able to pull into the rest of the theme and the execution. So I think that's cool done. Um, and I love this kind of black with the purple, right? And then the green, right? This is a really, really kind of cool layout in terms of the choice. I even like, of course, uh, just the black tube, uh, black tubing that we've got right in here. And then we've got a tough gaming board, which is a great kind of base for this, just with its all kind of black aesthetic that it has there. And we've got the Corsair memory that we can see in here. Really nice, clean routing job than done on the cables. So um, as you see right here, Michael says, yeah, drool, uh, great EVA edition, uh, very cool build. Colors are dead on uh, for the theme. I definitely agree. And Erica, oh, hey, Erica, I really like the color combination. Yeah, I, I like the color combination. I really am a big fan of this. So here we can see RGB lighting off and still showing it off. Really clean, nice execution. And here we can see actually how clean everything is in terms of being black, right? So the board, that really nice black tubing that you have right there. But then those purple cables. And of course, you can see the small little other accents that are present in there. So it looks really, really nice. And there we go back out. And uh, do I not? There's no other. Did they give us any other images? Uh, just those. Uh, well, overall, I mean, that's that's really cool. I love the way that this overall build came out. Really nicely clean. It's well executed. Nice runs overall in terms of this. Could have this 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 run maybe just kind of needs to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit maybe off right there, but otherwise really nicely done. Um, and I I'm uh, I, I really like the color scheme right here. So. Let's go ahead and um, let me go back to the beginning one. 
yeah so i think that that's cool because you can kind of see the whole little look right there right so um let's go ahead and bring up the the submission form so give me one second here guys uh wait oh that's weird where's his submission form Okay, so I don't have Joel's submission form right here. So, sorry, Joel, I can't go through the rest of your details. So, I'll try to see if I can get a hold of Joel to be able to confirm on the rest of his details um, and, you know, make sure we credit that and a follow-up um, little spotlight right there. But... Based on uh, what we can see right here, as I know for a fact, this is tough gaming because I can tell from the ID design, this is Z690. So he's got a Z690 based board right there. That's going to be DDR4 based um, in terms of that. And then two pin, this is probably 3070, maybe a 3080 based card right there. So overall, really nice combination in terms of the overall performance. And again, the overall design and layout, um, it's clean, it's well executed and definitely gets a nice thumbs up for me. All right. So another great build right there. So let's go ahead and go and check out more here. So, um, all right, we're going to go with two. All this. What do we go with? What do we go with? All right, uh, let's go with Ben. Ben over at Pidgey PCs, and then we're going to wrap things up with Snap. So we got two builds left here, guys. So let's get ready to go ahead and wrap things up here. Um, so let's go with Green Machine from Ben Whalen. Pidgey PCs. All right. This is a very cool build. I think this is his test bed system. Uh, that he went ahead and submitted right here. So he's been doing some testing. He recently launched his YouTube channel. If you guys want to go ahead and throw him a like and uh, subscribe, make sure to do that. Ben's a great member of our community. All right. So here we can see what do we got going on? All right. All right. So very, very cool. So here we can see we've got a core, uh, excuse me, a thermal take uh, core chassis. We've got some of the RG Evangelion, our tough gaming monitor we can see right there. Uh, cool little tower heatsink. Always nice to see. This might change out, of course, because I think based on the hardware, it depends on what he's going to be testing. So it's got different kind of configurations, but I think he just finalized this build and setup. So this is what we have going on there, but nice and clean, well executed, no issues. This is the only thing I wish in this core chassis is I wish they had like a little thing that you could hook over to kind of close that little part of the bay to make it just like a little bit cleaner. Um, but you know, he's packed everything in there nicely and clean. So there's nothing that's a, a point of concern right there um these are the x tile based edition versions of these fans so they have a kind of like a little bit of like almost like a g scale royal type of kind of patterning which gives them a really kind of like cool kind of um gem and kind of refracted type of property which is kind of interesting in terms of the overall layout it's got everything really cleanly managed and ben always does a great job when it comes to the cable management so clean and well executed and there we go with the lighting it towards changes the other the entire dynamic so i really love the way that this played out i actually remember giving him feedback that i wanted to see white and he actually sent over an image with white which was really cool because i think that the white with the green just pops i love that dark kind of green that kind of British racing green, kind of army green, that real kind of classic dark green. And then with that white, I think is a fantastic combination. Looks really, really good. So um, I really, really like the way that it pops right there. Really nice white, bright fans. And you can see it comes through. And this is the other reason why actually I like tower heat sinks. They look different and they also offer a really strong visual for the fan. And that's a really kind of cool look, which you just can't achieve with an AIO. So, um, you know, it's also... also when you're aligning with the right type of cooling solution for a gaming experience, there's nothing wrong with the tower heatsink. So I'm definitely a lot of times a fan of a tower heatsink combination. And I think it looks great in this build, right? So very, very cool. And it's clean. Plus, you also don't have to worry about a big old cable, you know, being routed anywhere or anything like that. So um, these x fans give you this nice kind of bright diffuse kind of almost kind of a halo-y type of aesthetic right there. The big, beautiful RGB light bar that's right there that's present. And then, of course, those x fans. And then the cool little kind of green accenting actually kind of works there with the Evangelion. So overall, really, really nice. I, I love the way that this turned out. Just clean, well-executed, functional. It's in my kind of type of, you know, especially for a test bed, it definitely makes sense. Nice clean cable management. We're taking use of space right there. He's got the cool bits power actually uh, fan and ARGB controller that's on there. So that can actually be interfaced with our motherboard to give you actually more headers. So everything can be synced through. Oh, that's cool. He's got seven back there. 
Props to him. Uh, this 7 was actually a limited edition figure. It only came with our Z11 chassis, uh, where you could buy Horseman independently. But that's cool that he's actually got that right there. Um, all routed, nicely clean there in the back. Yeah, nothing to get on right here. And then he's, of course, got his little hardware base all set up there right there in the back. But very cool. Clean, functional, well laid out. I think this is going to make a great foundation in terms of the test bed setup. So let's see. Ben is doing a great job with several projects. Uh, love the advice for the white lights. Oh, hey, Ben, fantastic, man. Yeah, definitely green. Suman's giving a, show, a shout out there with the racing green, right? Um, I did one for a friend with the PG Snow, right? Uh, British racing green. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. And dig the color case from H2O Computers. All right, very, very cool. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, Horseman is on the same shelf. Did I miss Horseman? Oh, no, no, no there we go. Okay, yeah, no, you're right there. Uh, I love that combination right there. So, all right, there we got Zaku, right? Uh, there we got Seven. We've got some RX. We, of course, got uh, Thanos of the Infinity, the Gundam Edition stuff right there from our prior collaboration. And then right there, Horseman is rocking it in the back. Very cool. I love it. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap things up right here with one last bill, guys. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at our friend Sneff, one, the only, the Canadian master, Okay, let's go ahead and see what we got going right here. Uh, this is, uh, he did two builds for us. And actually, I think <laughs> I was going to do the AP201. Actually, let me see if I can bring up. Okay, I'm going to leave it up to people. What do people want to see? Do people want to see the AP201 build or his scratch chassis build? They're both awesome. Um, so it's really hard for me to say like which one we should end up showing off. The scratch build is really, really cool. Um, and then the... Uh, AP201 build is really, really cool. So they're both cool. So I don't, I don't, I don't know which one we should pick. Um, so, but I think I right now only have images for the scratch build. I don't think I downloaded the images for the AP201. Oh, Suman's telling me the AP201. Yes. So, all right. Let me see if I can quickly download them from, if I have my Teams chat open here. Oh, we got you got scratch and then we got AP201. All right, I think it's gonna be scratch because that's the one that I've got right here immediately on hand. So we're gonna go with the scratch build. All right, uh, let's go for it right here. Yes, you're right. It was in the thumbnail. True, he did. You're right. You you totally right. Okay, you're totally right. Um, okay, let's let's make that happen. Okay, let me go ahead and. Uh, all right, give me one second, guys, here. I'm going to go grab, I believe, if I can go grab that scratch build really quick. Excuse me, the AP201. So let me go ahead and grab that, and I will get it situated here. I'm just going to run over one second, and I'm going to grab it. Because uh, let me see, CNE. Yeah, so I've got the scratch build right here. But I did put it, you're right, I did put it in the thumbnail. So I'm going to go ahead and get it. So give me one second, guys, and uh, I will be right back.
All right, guys, we're back. Sorry about that. So um, actually was not able to go ahead and pull that back. I had to uh, go ahead and uh, to swap that out. So we're going to definitely make sure to go ahead and show that one off on the next stream. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, just wrap it up here with this with the scratch build. And let me go ahead and just get this one loaded up right here. So what do I have it here? I've got it right here. There we go. All right. So let's go ahead and bring it up. This is a fantastic build. And I, I, I set this one aside, but I should have gone ahead and changed out that thumbnail. So apologies on that side. But let's go ahead and take a look at this beautiful build from Sneff. And again, uh, I think it's really cool because I think this is, you know, uh, of course, just from his perspective, I think this was the second revision of this uh, scratch. Um, but I think it's pretty cool in terms of just the work that he went ahead and put into being able to kind of custom develop something, which is pretty sweet. Right. Uh, you know, he's been continuing to, of course, I think, evolve everything that he's been doing right with, of course, so much custom work that he already does, but then be able to take it further, of course, and be able to incorporate something like um, a chassis into that that just takes things kind of the next level. So let's go ahead and take a look right here. So uh, beautiful. I love always that he always gives fantastic photos uh, in terms of giving us a lot of flexibility. So here we can see it all blacked out, right, with no RGB lighting. And right off the bat, it already looks really cool and really distinct, right? Um, I love the absolute kind of design aesthetic that we have right here, where it's got this kind of really interesting vibe in terms of its overall layout, where we have a little bit of kind of a heavier weighted base, and then it kind of is moving up in terms of the overall design, right? And then from there, of course, we've got this vertical block. We have really cool implementation right here, very minimal in terms of the overall kind of uh, quote unquote tubing, the kind of the water cooling perspective. It's tightly integrated to really be balanced. Uh, so you can see right here where you've got just one run going into this block right here, and then another goes right into the CPU. And this is a really cool design where you have this layered effect, which really was well done. The beautiful orange, which I think goes really great against the black, orange, and yellow are some of my absolute favorite colors. So I love being able to see that being a presence right here. Then you can see, of course, the distro back over here is beautifully integrated. And one of the really cool things is the diffusion that he has in this custom chassis looks great once everything gets overall illuminated but i love the overall color play that we have here where i think this just looks great when it's off right so black silvers orange a little bit of this transparency and then of course just the chrome accents just look fantastic right so um, as we move over here we can of course see that we've got something interesting going on here of course with the display really nice cool power button i love of course all the torque screws right right here that are present uh just giving it a really cool layered effect and i love all these just subtle geometric kind of um, impressions right which just give you a little bit of more kind of visual interest right because they have a little bit of depth um, that adds a little bit kind of to contrast and texture that you're looking at from here we've got our brand new tough gaming fan so he actually integrated the tough gaming 120 millimeter argb fans he was a big fan of our actually rg strip xf120 fans and now he's actually gone ahead and taken a grab uh, uh excuse me uh taking a chance to be able to integrate these in and he's actually uh, i think giving us some really great feedback there too that he's a big fan of these too so overall these are really cool in terms of the way they laid out on the other side where you of course got the radiator right so you can see one side and then you can see the other side right so um, we give you that really cool angled shot right there and now we go into the other side. You can see, of course, the motherboard has access there for the I.O., runs through the cables, and then we can see the PSU cavity over there. So motherboard, and then on that other side, radiator and fans, and then from there, of course, your PSU. All right, so let's go ahead and see. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a great one, right? It's nice to have the handle. I think with this type of system, it's really cool that, yeah, you can literally lift it up and you can move around. So it's really cool, and it's very compact in terms of being such a high performance system, but you could go ahead and lift it up. All right, are we ready to let it, to, to go ahead and turn this on? Let's go ahead and take it up. Oh, just look at that. <laughs> wow, um, so cool, right? So it went from looking really cool to then we just we took it to the next level, right? With the, with the lighting. So I think it has a really cool, just dynamic feel to it when you took the lighting 
and you put that all into play, uh, how it beautifully comes through in terms of the acrylic right here uh, to be able to kind of give it that little bit of diffusion. Acrylic is going to come through just a little bit brighter right there, but it's still diffused. You get that really cool kind of patterning bind that's there through that rainbow aesthetic. Um, and just, it looks so cool. And I love then the lighting effect that comes through here in terms of the distro, right? And then you've, of course, got that font present distro right there, which still has a fixed color scheme to give you some contrast. Then you've got the lighting right there on the board, right? So you see the nice little RG accent that's still visible. The team group memory, that Delta series memory looks fantastic right there with that nice diffuse bar. But then the silver comes into play to, again, give you another point and contrast, and it just looks fantastic, right? Um, really, really nice balance of not going crazy on the RGB, right? But giving you just these kind of visual focal points to be able to kind of almost encapsulate the build and then, you know, give you a little bit more pop in the middle, right? But then still be fleshed out with the rest of the items right there, right? Overall, super cool. And here we can, of course, see... Uh, then you can, as, I love this, right? He's got the stat panel readout information right there with the monitor. He's got GPU tweak running right there, which is really, really cool. And then there, orange. Now, this is where, I don't know, I'm torn, guys. What do you think? The orange or the rainbow? They both look really, really cool. And of course, here you got the orange, so that part of you might niggle at it, but I'm like, nah, it still looks fantastic. But I really love orange and yellows. So this, like, I'm really, really love this black and orange vibe. I think it looks fantastic, right? So um, let's see. Just enough RGB. Trippy how he ran the LED lights uh, see-through, uh, the plexi of the chassis. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, right? Um, I love those EK micro fittings, too. I'm using them now. Yeah, these, these little micro fittings are so cool in terms of being small, clean, and compact. Really kind of giving you a lot of nice flexibility, right, in terms of getting everything laid out, right? So what do you guys think? Do you think the, ra uh, the the rainbow or do you think the black and the orange? I'm going to go with the black and the orange combo. I think the black and the orange combo looks really good. And then there at the top, you can just see how much it really kind of shines through, right? Again, through that distro, the silver, I think, perfectly complements, right? That chrome accenting with the black. And then you're carrying that lighting all the way through, even on the top handle. And then when we go to the back, all right, it's a party in the front. And it's a party in the back because look at the back. Now you got all the RGB lighting with the Tough Gaming fans and it looks just so clean. Looks so cool. It's just uh, just looks really good. Yeah, another just masterclass build and fantastic. I mean, it's so cool, right? Because he helped, he designed the chassis. He's got everything laid out right there. And just uh, it's a beautiful job to be able to kind of put together this whole system. And it looks great. I love the way that this turned out. It's really, really great. And there you can see those beautiful Tough Gaming uh, dual array LED base fans that we've got right there. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it on that one. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I can bring up his submission form here quickly. All right. So this is a course from Snef, the one and the only, right? Um, it was a sponsor built. He actually worked with us to directly for this to be able to actually feature it at CNE. Um, so does the build have a theme? Not really. Maybe inspired a little bit by kind of military armor. I can kind of see that where it's got a little bit of that vibe. Uh, three words that he would use to describe the build is a different design, clean and unusual lights. I would definitely agree with that. Does the build have a name? No, he just called it CNE build. I love that. I'm going to just do this scratch one-off build, you know, for Asus to have it at the event. And, you know, I'm just going to call it the CNE build. So you guys got to tell me, you know, what are we going to call this instead of the CNE build? <laughs> um, so this is, of course, a custom case from Sniff, um, custom distro from Sniff. And then it's featuring our RG Crosshair 8 Dark Hero. Um, it's got a Tough Gaming uh, Radeon RX 6900 XT, a Thor 1200 watt power supply, the Tough Gaming 120 ARGB base fans, team group memory, uh, the Delta memory. I love the way that Delta memory looks in there. T-Force Cadre A440 M.2 base SSD. And then we've got a ton of EK water cooling hardware. So the Quantum Magnitude A M4 full nickel, uh, the tough vector uh, block that we have there as well. Cool stream PE 360. Um, then he's the DDC uh, that we have in there for, excuse me, the pump. 
um, torque fittings, and then uh, DRGB LED strips that he has in there and a lot more. Um, and then in terms of what was he most proud of is the case designed and made by me. I really like the design. And I think you hit it out of the park, man. It's got a serious dual thumbs up. You did a fantastic job. It looks stunning. Um, and I really would love to be able to put together in something like this. I really like the way that you approach the layout and the aesthetic. Um, I think it's really, really cool. And um, I think it's got a lot of kind of just flexibility to have the, that it looks different, which is something that I really like. It doesn't look like a lot of other uh, chassis that are laid out there. So I think that's pretty cool. Is there anything you would change about the build? Maybe add aluminum to the top handle. Oh, that could be interesting. Give you a little bit of kind of just a complimentary accent because you have the metal right here, right? With the chrome and the chrome right there, right? I could see that. That could be kind of an interesting accent. How long did it take together to put together the system? A lot. I stopped counting after 40 hours. <laughs> I can definitely imagine, right? Um, so the system's used for CNE. So we're going to be using it predominantly for showcasing gaming. I think we're going to have a wide range of games there, you know, some Destiny, Rainbow Six Siege, um, uh, and uh, some other stuff. So some, you know, just general kind of just demo system that we're going to be having at the gaming event. Um, and then he was a really big fan of actually the brand new Tough Gaming uh, 120 millimeter fans. He really likes the performance and the LED effect, effect overall a great fan. But at the end of the day, uh, this build is all about what you brought to the table with your creativity, your ingenuity. And again, you show why you're one of the absolute best builders in the game, modders. And uh, kudos, man. Just fit, finish, and execution is on point. And another one for the books, another masterclass build. Fantastic. So very, very cool. Hey, Richard. Uh, hi, greetings from Chile. I hope to buy an X670E Extreme with a Ryzen Next Generation Series CPU. Man, very cool, man. Thanks so much. All right. Well, guys, that wraps up our stream. Thank you guys for much, uh, for, for stopping in and checking this out. Um, hopefully, you guys enjoy the rest of your Friday. You have a good uh, weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. If you're going to be upgrading, best of luck with it. If you're going to be building, best of luck with it. And if you're just going to be enjoying your weekend, uh, gaming, chilling back, take care, take it easy, enjoy the rest of your day. And hopefully, I'll see you guys in the ASUS, ASUS PCDIY group. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat or hit us up in the group. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.